We are back. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> I don't understand the statement that was made prior to uh, the Mingo is a Marvel vs. Capcom 2 exclusive character. Uh, he is a giant fighting cactus that wears a sombrero and fights sure. with maracas. But why did you say, speaking of sad... I said to the prior thing we were talking about, that's sad. And you said, speaking of sad, and then we went right into this. There's sad moments in this. Uh, kinda, I guess. I don't not know. Really. It's not, the, it's not the greatest of segues. It's not one of my better ones. Okay, I, that's why I'm confused. <laughs> that's fine. So today we're talking about Labyrinth. Uh, it's a 1986 film that I have picked, and... Um, Stars Jennifer Connelly and David Bowie's crotch. I, well, a little bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> a little bit. But, but um, just before we really get started, as always, we're going to talk about the movie. We might talk about other stuff that isn't even related to the movie, but spoilers ahead. So um, if you haven't seen this movie that originally came out in 1986... And you want to, now is the time to pause. Yeah, if you are a Ute uh, that has not had the chance to, you know, be exposed to this, or maybe you are from our, our old, old age and just, it escaped you for some reason, you know, go, honestly, I would recommend going, watching it either way, so, uh, you know, go watch it and then come back. We'll wait. Pause it right now, you know, come back. We'll still yeah. be here. We'll be here. All right, now that you're back. Now that we're, now that we're ready here. Um... <laughs> There are uh, things that we usually start out with when, when we're talking about these uh, films, and it's, how did you first encounter this, David? So go ahead and tell me. When did uh, you first encounter this? I grew up with it as a child. It was just one of those many, many VHS tapes I grew up with that was perpetually on repeat when I was a youth. You probably had the 1999 version. There's different versions? Well... You probably had the 1999 re-release of the VHS, which eventually is what I had, but uh, I most definitely grew up with the very first release. Yes, it was released a couple of times. It's been released many times, but... I'm trying to remember... And re-re-re-released. I'm trying to remember if it had a clamshell or if it was in a slide box. I think it was a slide box. I don't know if that helps identify which version. Do you remember it starting out with TriStar? The no, I know what you're talking about, but no, I don't remember it starting with that. Okay, that's the 99 version, I believe, is when it starts out with the Pegasus, but I'm not positive on that. Um, Granted, you're asking me to remember something from I when I was a wee lad. Well, and, uh, I can rem Yeah, sure, that's fine. I also grew up with it, but like literally grew up with it. Uh, my mom used to work at this place where she put computer parts and, and things together, and uh, I kind of came along. It was not really a, a daycare. It was like their lunchroom area. They would <laughs> wheel out their TV cart like you would see in school sometimes. Uh, now they use DVDs more so than not. But um, an old school TV cart, um, pull out like uh, gymnast mattresses, a kind of mm. like those, like like those kind of like thin blue ones they'd have in yes. like school uh, gyms and stuff. Exactly. So uh, not you know professional gym mattresses, but um, gymnast type mattresses of of my youth anyway, which were essentially covered in tarp. Um, yeah. And I would have a blanket and a pillow, and I would lay down with that. There were um, a few different uh, vending machines in that section as well, and I remember getting coffee cakes when I could. Really loved their little coffee cakes. Um, and I would sit and watch this movie on repeat. Feel that. Uh, I yeah, know this one, Dark Crystal. And uh, the fucking Magic Trolls doll warrior movie there. Those were on a common repeat cycle at the same time in my youth. I'm going to say something controversial. What's that? I don't like the Dark Crystal. I know that. And I I get it. I still appreciate it very much from a special effects, like, practical. Like, that. that is a master class in practical special effects. 
They did a great job. And I just don't like it. Fair. And I, I do like the dark, moody setting. I, I like everything aesthetically about Dark Crystal. The story is not the greatest. It's, it's fine. You know, it, it's very much more about the mood, the atmosphere, and the actual, like, puppetry and everything else that goes into it. Yeah, um, there, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I hate the Skeksis. I think they're disgusting, and they scared me as a kid. Reasonable. Uh, did not enjoy them at all. I still have difficulty with the puppets that don't actually move the majority of their face. But we've had a conversation, you and I, about how I can't handle things that have incorrect faces. Yeah. Um, that's clowns that don't show their actual emotion. Um, what was the other one that was recent that I was like, I hate it? Uh, fuck, I think it was something I pointed out too. Yeah. Anyway, it's any anything that's kind of flat-faced and doesn't really have the emotion that you can tell. Yeah. Um, or really understand... It's, it's I'm sure it's a trauma response of some sort, but... I hate not being able to assess what someone's emotion or what they're actually doing or feeling. Um, hate it. So uh, they can never be trusted, and therefore all of the puppets in um, the Dark Crystal, except for the Skeksis, because they always look terrible, um, <laughs> none of them can be trusted. Reasonable. So um, in this, though, we do have some differences between that and this, where Dark Crystal was all puppetry, this actually has humans, um, which we've recently talked uh, about uh, uh, Muppet Christmas Carol, yes. which is also a combination of human and puppet um, acting, which is pretty cool. So we have David Bowie, who plays Jareth, the Goblin King. Uh, we have Jennifer Connelly, who is Sarah. And I, I swear I knew this, but also never remember that this is a thing. She has a last name. Really? Yeah, it's Williams, apparently. Huh. Um, and then Toby, who is her little brother. She has a, a mom and a dad, but they're really not seen very frequently. It's in the beginning, and that's kind of it. Yeah. Um, and then there's all of the puppetry and all of uh, the puppeteers that have gone into this. So, um, but one especially that I want to call out is um, Sherry Weiser and Brian Henson. So Brian did the voice of Hoggle. But Sherry was um, the human in the suit that yeah. played Hoggle. And that is a huge undertaking. Um, it, they also had other puppeteers moving Hoggle's face and doing all the expressions. But... Um, yeah, there was like five of them working on that. Yeah, there were a bunch of them that went into working a single puppet. Um, which was pretty cool. <laughs> so for anyone who has joined us uh that's fine i'll fix it in post okay cool um <laughs> uh we had a little bit of a blip of what we were showing on screen that's fine um uh, but the um the other people involved include um frank oz and um karen prell there are a bunch of other people and i'm going to mention one in just a moment um that is someone that we know and love in many different things but um, Crispin Freeman. No. Do you want me to tell you now? I can tell you now. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll wait till a good moment for it. Okay. Um, but there are several characters that we're going to encounter. And of course, with all of the puppetry, as tends to be, many puppeteers operate multiple puppets throughout different scenes and sections, uh, especially with um, the Henson group. So you're going to see them a lot, or you're not going to see them a lot, but you might sometimes pick up on their voices. Um, so Sarah is a girl kind of still living in a fantasy world, and she um, is <laughs> off having a fake play with... Um, kind of self-LARPing, really. Yeah, and um, she's being watched by this barn owl. She's got her dog with her, and then she realizes that she's late to be back home because she's supposed to be babysitting. She gets back home. Her stepmother is um, what I, I... I wouldn't say as rude as I would have thought when I was a child. Yeah, as a kid, I remember her being like an absolute bitch, but watching as an adult, I'm like, no, I kind of see where she's coming from here. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's the 80s, so it's not like she's going to have a cell phone on her, especially a kid, Yeah. Um, to let her family know that she's coming home, and oh, I'm sorry, I'm late, but um, her mom, or her stepmom and her dad are supposed to, like, go out to dinner and have a date night or whatever, and Sarah's supposed to watch her little brother, so stepmother's son, and um, her father's son, Toby, and... Uh, the stepmother is like, you're an hour late. And she's like, I said, I'm sorry. I was like, wow. I uh, mean, I'd be concerned. It's pouring rain. Um, but I didn't like that the mother was like, no, you have to to send the dog to the garage because he's soaking wet. I mean. Poor pupper didn't ask for that. Let, no. Let, let the pupper get dried, get warm. Yeah. I mean, we don't know the, the in-betweens, but it sure seemed like Sarah just kind of went upstairs and but suddenly she's dry and so maybe they took care of the dog and made sure that the dog was dry as well but he had to go into the garage first i don't know but i did find that i was like what rude and then we also get an exchange that's kind of weird where again when i was younger i definitely was very much more on sarah's side but like again now that we're older i i (laughs) kind of see the stepmother's point of view too where (laughs) Uh, Sarah's like, ah, oh, you don't even ask me anymore if I have plans. And her stepmother's like, I'd fucking love it if you have plans. If you would just tell me you have plans, we could make other arrangements. Yeah. And she's like, ah, oh, you don't care. And it's like, no, nah, I kind of see where the stepmother is coming from. Like, you apparently have such a consistent enough behavior that you don't do fuck all with anyone else and you're just going to be a cave troll. I'm okay with that kind of life. I get it. You know, you do you. But at the same time, like, yeah, if you're gonna be around like yeah on some level i do think it's wrong for parents to treat their older children as just babysitters for the younger ones i do think that philosophically that's wrong you're the parent not the older child yeah but comma however i i feel like if it's like a babysitting job then that's one thing like if you still treat it like someone who is a babysitter who is, you know, called upon to do the sitting of the child, fine. Yeah, go ahead and, you know, toss them some money and be like, hey, you know, just be responsible for the night. But the problem that I have with what the stepmother says is, I'd like it if you had a date. You should have dates at your age. So it's dating specific. Fair. And I do, I hate that part because for Sarah that seems extremely, extremely outside of her comfort zone at this point. She's still like, a young girl. I was going to say, it's also extremely weird because I didn't realize she was this young. Uh, because, again, child me growing up with it, I'm like, ah, she seems so older, uh, so much older and yeah. more mature. And then watching this as an adult, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's a baby. Uh, yeah. Because she's 14. Yes. And if she was 16, fine. I could maybe understand the mother's comments a little bit more because that's closer to that, like, Yes. Very hormonal, blossoming age of, you know, teenage years. But 14, I'm like, no, that's a baby. You stop. You stop. No. What do you mean you should be out having dates? And my concern also is nowadays, yeah, sure, maybe I would have gone off and played with friends. But, like, nowadays that still seems extremely young to me to just let them kind of go off on their own. And... Assume they're coming back. I mean, it was the 80s. I I, I know. (laughs) You don't know this. I I literally grew up with this this movie. I'm going to say it. Is younger than I am. (laughs) But it did have its first release um, when I was just a couple years old. So, um... But it is younger than I am. It is older than I am. I know it is. That's, <laughs> that's our life. Uh, so, <laughs> so Sarah has a bit of a, a stomping of herself going up the stairs and basically locking herself away. Um, and the father says, I'll talk to her. And his talking to her is through her door. And is like, well, we're going to leave now. Okay, Bye. And I, I do love her response. Like, yeah, you really want to talk practically knock down the door because, yeah, no, yeah. he handled it like shit. Yeah. Truly, it, it, it's 
the kind of dichotomy where if they wanted to set up that they did actually care. Like, I feel like I got more empathy out of the stepmother than I did him. Yeah. And maybe it's just a different time period kind of thing where that's just, ah, uh, yeah, the 80s. <laughs> uh, men don't need to worry about really raising their children unless they're men. And then, you know, we got to get you into the sports, buddy. we got to get my little sports champ. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, if it's, you know, a girl's like, yeah, whatever, you, you're fine. You're still breathing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I still did dislike that we didn't get much empathy out of him. Of course not. Um, but of course, that that's the whole point. That's what kind of begins to set things in motion for us here. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure that Sarah, because she has pictures of her mom up, and it seems like her mom was much more into, like, the acting kind of a thing. Um, which is where she gets all of her sort of uh, play and fantasy stuff that you see in her room. She was destined to be a theater kid. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, and so it looks like her mother was in a play based on the imagery that we see. Uh, and I think that Labyrinth was one of the plays that she was in. Um, yeah, that's because she has like the book Labyrinth. Yes. Uh, earlier in the film and as well, she puts it on her desk later. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes into, like, one of the recurring fan theories, uh, which I feel like the... Because uh, I looked them up after you started mentioning a couple of them, and it's interesting to go ahead and look at some of those theories and then re-watch the film with some of them in mind. Yep. Uh, there's definitely a couple that I feel are a little stronger in subtext than others. Yeah. Um, I still don't think any of them are, like, 100% there, but I feel like there's some nuggets of like, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Uh, I also wonder if some of those fan theories kind of go off of one of the, I think, 25 iterations of the original script it was. Mm. Because that had multiple changes uh, to the story and kind of the theme as well. Um, but uh, with the book of Labyrinth, there is a very specific phrase that Sarah has extreme difficulty memorizing and from a youth from my tiny little self when i was you know no bigger than up to my knee i had a big problem that i could memorize this whole movie <laughs> and she could not memorize a single block of text including a very key phrase that later on becomes an extremely key phrase <laughs> How can you not remember the last few words that you need to break the spell? And that's part of the problem is it is to break a spell, basically. So, of course, she can't remember it. And I was like, you're an idiot. Why did they Why did they hire you as the actress? I could have had this done in five minutes. I don't need 13 hours to solve this labyrinth. I could do it myself. <laughs> well, you would have asked clarifying questions of those in the labyrinth. I would have, most assuredly. <laughs> Which we'll get to that in a moment. But. Yeah. So um, Sarah is left to basically just they up and leave. They're gone. Yeah, they're um, gone. She's got uh, little Toby crying in the crib. Yeah. Uh, in the most stupid looking fucking Waldo striped onesie. Uh, yeah. Um, it it has to be something I think that visually can be recognized against everything else in the background Fair. and all of the everything. Um, is already taken up by either colors from everything else, uh, for, like, the, the goblins and stuff, um, or with, um, Sarah's outfit as well. Because she's got on blue jeans and, um, like, a white peasant top and a, um, uh, or a pirate top, I should say, and, uh, a vest. Yep. So, we can't really put Toby in blue, um, because <clears throat> it's not going to look quite right. Plus, if he's up against uh, Jareth, Jareth has, like, gray tights-ish yeah, yeah, yeah. leggings. So, visually, it'll help him stand out. And especially in other scenes where he needs to be very visual, like, in the very end. Yeah. I can understand why they put him in something like that. Yeah, that makes sense from a comp uh, composition standpoint. Right. So, Toby's screaming his brains out, um, and Sarah's like, ugh, here we go again. But she realizes that one of her teddy bears is missing, and she's like, of course he has it. So uh, she goes in there and basically has a meltdown and says that she 
is going to tell him a story of how um, there was an evil stepmother who always made her stay home with the baby. Um, but one night when baby had been particularly cruel to her, um, she basically calls on the Goblin King to come and take him away. And we see that there are goblins at this moment. Yeah. And they're like, Shh, she's going to say it. And she's like, <laughs> she goes in the complete wrong way. And she's like, Goblin King, Goblin King, take the child away from me. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, that's not it. Where'd she learn that rubbish? Yeah, which is kind of interesting because considering how of how everything actually gets kicked off, it's weird that the goblins are just big chilling in her closet, like, all right, we're waiting as if they're going to be the ones to just, like, snatch the kid and run. Yeah. Um, which was a rewrite. Really? Well, it the whole thing originally started with Jareth um, dressing up as another thing, um, another person, and stealing the baby. Huh. And he's only revealed when she, like, kicks him and fights him instead of her actually wanting to be gone. Uh, and then accidentally she says the correct words and all the lights go out, nothing will turn on. Toby is now missing from his crib and he is no longer screaming his brains out. And we start seeing, like, um dust bunnies almost mm. of goblins that are just kind of like running around and sort of that that trick that happens when you're alone in the dark of you think you see something out of the corner of your eye but there is actually something there so there's laughter and there is the barn owl like smacking itself against the window it's still pouring and um then in a <sighs> a mass of glitter and wind the the doors open um in this bedroom and in comes david bowie who yes. has transformed from this owl uh and he is trying to offer sarah everything that she wants in exchange for the child i will give you whatever you want this is a gift and he holds up this orb this uh crystal ball and she's like, what is it? He says, it's a crystal. Nothing more. Um, but if you turn it, you know, it'll show you your dreams. And essentially gives it off to her. Um, or holds it out to her. And she's like, mm, no, I need my brother back. <laughs> Probably like, oops, I made a mistake. That is wrong. I actually need my brother. Um, and in her rejection, this changes into something malicious. A snake that he throws at her. But when it lands, it actually turns into a goblin. Yeah. So, a lot of transfiguration that happens. And then um, we transform from being in that bedroom to looking out on the labyrinth. And he says he's going to give her 13 hours to solve the labyrinth to get her baby brother back. Um, and she's like, fine. I guess I'll have to. Uh, and he goes off and disappears. And she's like, well, I guess I better get going. So makes her way down to the entrance as best she can of where to get into the labyrinth uh, and meets Hoggle, mm. who is peeing in a pond. <laughs> uh, and in peeing in a pond, um, he's also there just kind of like um, bug spraying all the fairies. Yeah, I, it's such an interesting introduction to the character because in a way it... It gives us a false setup for who we're about to interact with. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing a character just, like, outright pissing in the wind, literally. Uh, and, you know, uh, Sarah's like, hey, excuse you. He's like, fucking excuse you, I'm pissing here. Yeah. And then right into being just aggressive, killing the fairies, warning her that they're nasty little shits. Uh, but considering the traits that he immediately exhibits throughout the rest of the story, it's just fascinating that we see him in a grotesque, very aggressive standpoint as the first introduction just to kind of reveal the coward he actually is. Yeah. Which also feels like an interesting parallel to how we'll be dealing with our main villain in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I like our first interaction with him as well because he doesn't seem like a terrible character as in, um, character of a person um a person's character not just the actual as a character as a fake creation of a being um 
he himself is neither good nor bad, but he almost starts preparing her to enter the labyrinth because she starts asking questions and he doesn't answer them. He answers them honestly, like my father and you have answered them. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you and my father would have gotten along because <laughs> it's the same kind of questions um, and answers. Like uh, the only question that is asked is then answered explicitly as it's been asked doesn't take the inference of what the question is actually asking, only answers the base of that question. Kind of like when you ask me if I need a hand and you start <laughs> clapping. Um, it's it's like those kinds of questions and answers. And, and for the audience, uh, I laugh so heartily at that because it's gotten to the point where if I explicitly ask, do you need a hand, I will either get just a look or no, and then I will rephrase the question of, do you need assistance, and then I'll get a yes. Yes, because I can't <laughs> trust you anymore. Uh, so, basically, Hoggle does the same thing with Sarah, and um, is like, you know, if you ask the right question, you'll get the right answer, kind of yeah. a thing. Uh, and she's like, how do I get into the labyrinth? He's like, ah, see, that's the right question. You get in there, and then these doors magically open, and she's able to enter the labyrinth. Um, and she has a moment where she thinks she's almost alone, but he's right there still, and kind of spooks her a little bit. Uh, and he asks her, you know, well, what are you going to do? Which way are you going to go? And she's like, I don't know. They both look the same. He's like, that's not going to get you very far. So um, he's like, fine, whatever. Leaves her to her own business, and the doors close, and he's no longer standing there with her. She starts walking down what looks like a corridor of the labyrinth and just keeps on going until she's like this what do they mean there are no turns there are no openings or anything it just keeps going it goes on and on and uh then she's like oh well no and starts thinking of things that all of these people including jareth including poggle have started to teach her like maybe i'm taking it for granted that it yeah. does so she starts running thinking, well, maybe it just, it's really long. Until she gets to a point where she's like, this, this isn't helping. She gets frustrated, falls down, and encounters someone. <laughs> one of my favorite someones. Agreed. Um, that uh, just initially says, hello. And she's like, did you say hello? She goes, no. No, I said hello, but close enough. Yeah. And it's still another one of those things that's like, no, you didn't say the right phrase or the right thing. Yeah. Which is another sort of idea that comes into play. If you don't say the right words, you're not going to get the right ending. Yeah, it is definitely a recurring motif that plays out pretty smoothly throughout. I, I Again, there's a lot of kind of fairy tale... Oh, what's, the, what's the exact phrase I'm looking for? But there... You know how in a lot of fairy tales there would be like a consistent recurring theme that leads up to the eventual message of the story sure there's an exact phrase for it and it's escaping my brain right now but that's used for honestly all of the kind of growth points for the characters throughout yeah definitely um i know what you're talking about but it's not it's not there my brain's a little mushy still so with with this um worm he what I love about this worm, and he's he's like, come inside and meet the missus. She's humongous in comparison to him. <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, come inside. No, no understanding of size. I gotta imagine he had a plan. I feel like probably because he also knew things about the labyrinth, as we find out. Um, but he basically tells her, you're just not looking at things correctly. So you need to look at things in a different way. There's an opening right across from us. Um, and she's like, no, there's not. And he's like, sure there is. Just, you know, sit and we'll, we'll have a cup of tea and then you can go about your business. And she's like, no. So she stands up and, and walks over and realizes that she can actually walk through the section. Yeah, it's kind of one of those visual illusions where the walls are so near each other that yep. from this exact angle she's sitting, it looks like one wall as opposed to a door gap and then more walls on either side. Yeah, um... And it's, it's perspective. Yeah. So, you know, the, 
the bricks of what we're looking at are a certain size and therefore likely the bricks behind it are a larger size to match your perspective of distance. Which also feels like a good kind of like foreshadowing to the final confrontation. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, if you do watch the um, Inside the Labyrinth, I think is what it's called. Um, yeah, Inside the Labyrinth um, uh, behind the scenes sort of like hour long documentary, uh, you'll see some really cool shots of some of the perspective changes because they didn't build the, the entire giant labyrinth, but yeah. due to perspective shots, there are some really cool things that you see there. Yeah, it's really cool how they got a lot of that to actually function in a practical effect way. Yeah. Uh, truly, uh, we have said this before on the podcast many a times, and I will say this till my dying breath, uh, practical effects will just always look better. Yes, because you don't have to worry that something wasn't there and had to be put in after. Yeah. And whatever limitations of computer generation happens and what we then become so used to seeing because of all of the advancements in computer gen, we can tell, humans can tell, typically, when something is real or not. And the further and further we get into different um, abilities of computers to take on that uh, necessity for us to include those certain visuals we're still eventually going to get to a point where we can see that that's still fake. Yeah. Um, if it's really there, it really happened, so you've actually recorded it. Um, there are some really cool things that happened with the um, the recording of this and the visuals of this, too, because there is a scene that we will eventually get to where they used black velvet. Uh, and I had told you about this, and it was, like, before green screen. Yeah. So, um instead of using green screen, it was black velvet, which is very cool. Um, so uh, Sarah is like, cool, I'm just going to go. And she starts heading down one section of the labyrinth and is like, thanks, got to go. Bye to the worm. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. Never go that way. And she's like, oh, well, thanks. And just turns and goes the other way. But it was, again, because her question that she asked is how to get through the labyrinth not to the center of the labyrinth. Yeah. So you're not explaining what you need, and therefore there is going to be a situation that occurs, which is exactly what happened, where we linger with the worm for a second, and the worm says, well, if she'd have kept on going down that way, she'd have gone straight to their castle. And that's what she needs to do. Yeah. But instead, the questions weren't asked correctly. Which also feels like a good euphemism for life. Just... Just fucking ask what it is you need, you know? Just kind of get get to the fucking monkey, as we've discussed before. <laughs> yes. Yes, get to the monkey. Um, so she's going on and, and keeps on traveling, uh, and she's encountering now more uh, turns and curves and um, uh, actually a labyrinth, so a maze. She does have the smart idea of taking the lipstick out of her pocket because she was basically playing around in her room a little bit before she had left. So assuming that she stuck the lipstick in her pocket before all of this happened. Yeah. Uh, and she marks where she's headed with arrows. So she knows which way she's gone already. But the creatures of the labyrinth turn all of the tiles that she's walked on either completely over or they switch them or they move them around uh, and so she's not going to know which way she actually went because they're changing it. Yeah. In doing so, she encounters two of my favorite, favorite characters of this. I mean, it, it's hard to pick favorite favorites, but almost any time we encounter a door situation <laughs> is truly where I love them. Uh, and so we get these um, almost like playing card characters there's yes. um so if you were to take a playing card in a, a deck and see um the face characters there's like one on top one on bottom and they're opposite of each other yeah the so jack they're flipped. king queen exactly and that's kind of what they are but they're behind what looks like almost a shield and uh they tell her essentially that she's at a dead end and she was like no I was, you know, that was a dead end a minute ago. And they're like, no, the dead end's behind you. And she's like, it keeps changing. <laughs> How am I going to get out of here? Um, and it's the ones on the bottom that are at first talking to her instead of the ones that are at the top. Um, and she's like, well, how do I get out? And they're like, well, you could turn one of these doors. 
She's like, well, which, you know, which is which? Because one of them will take her to the center, they're saying. One of them will take her to the center of the labyrinth and the other one leads to... Spum-bum-bum-bum. <laughs> certain death. Yeah. Uh, so... Then she's like, well, which is which? And they're like, well, I don't know. We we don't know. Uh, but you can ask them. And they basically point uh, up to the other halves of them. And they say, you can't ask us. Ooh, you can only ask one of us. And then they give her rules. Uh, and one of us always lies. And one of us always tells the truth. And so she has to figure out which door to take. Um, so she asks a question. Would he tell me that this door leads to the center of the castle, and based on her logic, she thinks she's chosen the right door. Uh, I love these little guys. They make me so happy. Um, but she ends up falling through a hole. Yeah, we and uh, real quick on the door dilemma, too, because we Googled it uh, <laughs> after, because we were both like, how the fuck do you solve it in this scenario? And the funny part is, is that she actually was right on how to solve it. Yes. The problem is, is that she was dealing with it from an already unreliable narrator standpoint. Yep. Where she was given the rules in pieces, so it's presumed that they were already lying to her. Which is something, I, I had told you, David, this before. <clears throat> I had a dream about it once, and I was like, I solved it! <laughs> because I knew that they could be unreliable because of the way that it kind of went back and forth. So you don't know if one of them could tell the truth and one of them lies because that's that's not how it's truly stated. So uh, you can't trust them. You can't trust either of them. And <clears throat> I was like, well, I solved it. And then, of course, I was sleeping, so I didn't actually solve it. But um, we were struggling because I was like, no, there's... It seems right, but it's wrong. Yeah. And so what we find is that she does go through the door. Um, and she's like, I think I'm getting smarter. And she falls through uh, an opening, like a trapdoor, into a pit of hands. Helping hands. Helping hands. I love the helping hands as well. Uh, she's screaming for help. <coughs> and they're like, what do you mean help? We are helping. We're helping hands. And she's like, "They're you're hurting. So they ask, would you like us to let go? So they're also like toying with her. So she drops a little bit further into this hole and all of these hands are making face puppets out of their hands, which are really cool. There are some really, really cool faces that are made mm. in this section, which I'm sure didn't help me in any of my formative years picking out faces and things. Because <laughs> even still, to this day, I will... I will usually smack you or um, <laughs> jostle you in some way and go, look, 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 it looks like this. And you're like, I love you. And I'm like, I love you too. Um, Granted, also now it has spread to me a little bit because we have one neighbor that has a car that looks like it has the angriest face. <laughs> well, all cars do have faces, of course. Front and back faces. So if you didn't already have that in your brain, that's a problem. I did not already have that in my brain. They all have faces. You have to pick a happy car. You can't pick an angry car. Unless your intention is to always have the angry car. <laughs> you gotta look for a happy car face. Okay. Happy journeys. Love you. See? Like that. Uh, so, um, I saw two cats dancing once in shadows when we went to, um, an opera house for an event. And you were like, yep, sure does. That's what that looks like. <laughs> So I'm sure this didn't help with that. Uh, and in doing so, this uh, these hands then also speak to her through those faces. And they ask her if she wants to go up or down. And she's like, I guess uh, I'm going to go down. And they're like, yeah, okay. So they drop her. Yeah. Uh, and she ends up in the oubliette. And, uh, Which is a fun word. It is a fun word. There was a whole thing on TikTok where someone was like, uh, words you probably have never heard of. And they used oubliette, and they're like, anybody know what that would mean? And everyone who has ever seen this film was like, you should choose a different word. <laughs> we know what this is. Uh, but we then also see that Jareth is able to see what's happening through one of his own crystal balls and tells all of the goblins around him that 
he can see that she's fallen into the oubliette and they're all like happy and joyous about it. And he's like, stop it. We're not in the clear yet. Um, but Hoggle's going to go and basically take her back to the beginning. And when she knows she has to start all over, she's going to give up. And that's kind of the interesting thing is when we, cause throughout the rest of the film, we'll kind of like cut back to him a bit more. He really just does seem more annoyed than anything else. He really yeah. has the air of, I don't want to fucking be here. Yeah. Which is funny. Um, and in the, the inside the labyrinth behind the scenes, David Bowie says that he feels like the character is just kind of bored of it all. He doesn't, this isn't his thing. He doesn't want to be here. He'd be better in some place like Soho. And I was like, <laughs> all right, yeah, I guess, I guess that makes sense. But uh, it's, it's uh, where we then have her, Sarah, in um, really just a dark place, essentially left to left to think about everything and despair. Uh, and then Hoggle comes in and um, lights like a candle. And she's like, oh, it's you. And he's like, yeah, it's me. Uh, so I can take you back to the beginning. And she's like, no. What if I give you this plastic bracelet? <laughs> he's like, ooh, plastic. <laughs> yeah. Which um, seems weird. But then when you're putting it in the context of like, he's in this fantasy world. He probably has very rare, if any, access to plastic. That's probably genuinely more valuable than the jewels. Yeah. It's something that's a novelty. So um, he puts on the plastic bracelet and is like, cool, all right, I guess I'll take you as far as I can. Which is not an accurate measurement of distance um, or really a good um, contract, I should say. No. The words that you've chosen, again, can come back and bite you so a cool thing that they do is there's this door that hoggle puts up uh opens it one way and it's a bunch of stuff that falls out yeah it's like a broom closet yeah and then says oh you know wrong closet and then opens it up again and it's now a tunnel to lead out (laughs) so they're they're going through uh they go through the tunnel they're kind of in um like an underground tunnel section now. And they encounter this uh, ball that starts rolling. And it's another one of those crystals. And and Hoggle's like, oh, crap. But it ends up in a beggar's cup. And the beggar's like, so what have we here? Hoggle says, which is, this is something that I say repeatedly in life. Um, Which is, Hoggle says, nothing. And then... It's actually Jareth, and he says, nothing, nothing, (laughs) nothing, tra-la-la. And whenever I encounter the word nothing, and it's something especially that I've said, the rest of that at least is playing out in my brain (laughs) constantly. So if I were to text you, I'm going to the store, what do you need? And you text me, nothing. That is going to be what happens in my brain. Um, Which is one of the reasons why I've avoided asking a question that could end up with nothing. And I usually will go with something like yes or no at that point instead. Do you need anything from the store? Yes, no. Yes, this, no, no. So, um, uh, Hoggle is told that he is going to be thrown in the bog of stench um, if he actually really helps Sarah and... Um, Sarah says that it's a piece of cake so far, so Jareth ups the stakes and um, takes away some of the hours that she has left to solve the labyrinth. Because of it being, quote, so easy, Jareth then gives them something else they have to handle, which is the cleaners of these tunnels, which is a giant drill, basically. Um, And they have to run away from it. They do run away from it, so Hoggle and Sarah run away, They end up crashing through this sort of door that they've pushed down uh, and they see the cleaners go by, which are just goblins. Um, It's reminiscent of those push uh, train track things. Yeah, little trolleys. Yeah. Hand trolleys, I think is what it's called. Yeah, it's something, I don't know what they're actually called, so I don't know. But um, that's what it looks like, is um, like a seesaw version that just... Uh, bicycles its way through the tunnels 
So they realize that they're in a section where there's a ladder. The ladder will go up. And Sarah's like, how can I trust you if I knew that you were just going to betray me? And he's like, well, you don't really have a choice. What yeah. choice have you got? Yeah, he's like, I, one, I'm not going to fucking tell the king of the goblins to his face. Nah, bro, I'm fucking helping her. Yeah. And two, you got no options. Um, and then another visually cool thing happens is they climb out of this giant urn, almost. Um, but underneath it, there's no ladder when you see them coming up. It's just a very cool visual thing that happens. Yeah. Um, visual trickery. But when they're out of this urn, Hoggle says, cool, I'm done. Bye. That's as far as I can take you. And she's like, that's, that's not fair. So she takes his jewels and she kind of learns in this moment when he says, that's not fair. She says, yeah, you're right. It's not fair. And, but that's what it is. So, kind of like in life, yeah. as she's encountered repeatedly, she has said things like, that's not fair. And life isn't fair. And she's learning that. <sighs> not to say that that's a good thing, that life isn't fair. But no, to it... know that it's going to basically screw you over. She took the wrong part of the lesson to heart. Yeah. Uh, they encounter another one of my favorite characters, which is like a wise man who has a talking hat. <laughs> I love his talking <laughs> hat so much. Uh, and he's a little bit slow with how he talks. So the hat is swift. A little bit faster. Um, and she's like looking for advice and um, he tells her that sometimes it seems like we're not getting anywhere when in fact we are, and the hat says it for him, basically, when we are, and he's like, ugh. And he tells the hat, will you please be quiet, and all this other stuff, and then, um, it's, it's one of my favorite scenes, too, but, uh, and sometimes the way forward is also the way back. I mean, you're in a labyrinth, so it makes sense, but also... Yeah. You can't always get to where you need to go going in a straight line, um, which is actually kind of really good life advice. Yeah, and if, I was going to say, it feels like a good euphemism for growing up as well. Yeah. Because sometimes you do need to kind of go back to your roots and kind of restart on your journey. Yeah. Um, if you don't like who you are, you can start again. You don't have to stay that person. We've had that conversation about Scrooge. You don't have to be your old miserly self. You can change. Um, so that is certainly good advice, but, uh, in order to pay for that advice, they ask, you know, leave a contribution in the box and he's got like this little, um, change box that he can shake around. Um, and she parts with a ring that she's been wearing. So and Hoggle's like, no, cause he loves jewelry. Yeah. Um, but you know, you didn't have to give him that. He didn't say anything or nothing as he says. Um, and then they go off to try and continue their journey. So Hoggle is going to stay with her because she has all of his things. Yeah. His his precious things, anyway. But they hear a growling, um, a screaming, really, a howling, uh, as well as a bunch of um, kind of laughter, I would say, and, like, choppy noises. <laughs> because they have... there's There are these characters that are guards-ish. They're like a group of just goblins that are not, not too nice. Um, and they have, like, the goblin version of one of those T-Rex chompers. Yes. That you have, like, there's, it's like a T-Rex head on a stick and you've got the, the jaw-closing mechanism on the bottom. That's essentially what they have, is the goblin version of that. So, naked moles at the top with giant teeth. <laughs> and um, they're chewing on this giant fuzzy creature that they have strung up by his feet. Uh, but Hoggle has left um, because he is afraid of the noise and um, he's like, just keep the jewels. I don't care. I'm out of here. So Sarah goes to investigate because she's now saying, well, not everything is what it seems. So I'm going to go see what's going on. Yeah. And this is where we encounter Ludo. My she second a, favorite character. I do love him. Uh, and so she uh, helps by throwing um, rocks that uh, Ludo has called. So he calls rocks as one of his special gifts. Um, rocks are friends. Rocks friends. Yeah, so he um, is able to call them. 
closer to him, and in doing so, she has now projectiles to throw at these, like, goblin-y guys with their T-Rex goblins on sticks. Um, you know, it, explaining it sounds honestly weirder than it actually is. I mean, I mean, you know, if you're trying to visually understand what it is, then if you haven't seen it, you may not understand what, what it is, but... Um, she makes it so all of these kind of soldiery guys with their mole rat sticks um, are uh, biting each other and they're turning all around and they're all discombobulated and because they're all kind of off on their own, they um, uh, they leave it open for her to be able to get Ludo down. Yeah. And so she's like, I hope that you are what you seem because you're like a nice looking guy, but uh, you know, you can't really trust anything. So she does get him down um, with a big old whump. She's like, oh, sorry. But he's, he seems nice. And so he's like, oh yeah, we're friends. And uh, in being friends, she's like, all right, well, I guess let's continue our journey together. So they do. And they encounter two of my other favorite characters, yet again, doors. Um, well, they're just the knockers, babe. They are, they are the knockers, but it's a, a situation, because the other guys weren't actually doors either, but it has to do with doors. Fair. So I love them as well. Um, they're the knockers. So we have two door knockers, um, and one of them has the ring in its mouth, and the other has the ring in its ears. And this is another thing that I say repeatedly, um, because she tries, you know, like, which of these ugly characters should we choose, Ludo? Uh, and the one with the ring in his ear says it's very rude to stare. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. And the other one's mumbling because it's got the ring in his mouth. And uh, so there's this back and forth banter. It's one of my favorite banters. But... Um, with the banter, there's a thing that's said, which is um, <laughs> what I say all the time if I can't hear someone, which is no good. And then there's this giant sniff that he makes. Can't hear you. <laughs> and that is another thing that stays in my head constantly. <laughs> um, but they take the ring out of one of them's mouth, the one that has it in his mouth, and Ludo puts it in his mouth. And, you know, <laughs> he's very much a, a youthful um kind of giant. He, yeah. he encounters the world curiously. Um but can also be a little bit scared, which he is in a little bit, which is sad. Um but he's he's sweet. So that's kind of what happens. And um they end up having to sort of trick one of the knockers, the knocker with the ring that was in its mouth, to put the ring back in. Well, it's less of a trick and more like she fucking suffocates the poor thing. Yeah. Yeah. She just fucking... He's trying to, like, hold his mouth shut so that way she can't uh, put the knocker back in. So then she just puts her hand on his nose and just clamps so he can't breathe through his nose. Uh, so this she was content to potentially make this motherfucker pass out and just shove the knocker back in. Well, yeah. Yeah, she was. Um, and so they tell her, you know, knock and the door will open. That's how you get through. Um, and so she does. She knocks and then the door opens and she says, you know, I'm sorry. In order to get through, she had to do what she had to do. And he says over his ring, that's all right, I'm used to it. Which is another thing that happens in my brain too. Um, but they're now in a forest. So they're walking through this forest, her and Ludo. And, um... What happens is Ludo suddenly falls through um, a trapdoor again, and she's left alone. So she's scared at this moment as well, but Ludo is also scared when he was walking through. She's like holding his hand for a little bit. Yeah, she's like, come on, big gal, let's, let's yeah. go. But um, he's now gone. We don't know what happened to him, but she is now walking through, and we start hearing this noise that is like the spitting of a fire 
and uh or like sticks almost clacking together and that's where we encounter the fireies which and i mentioned to you when we were watching it uh for the umpteenth millionth time but when i was a wee lad i really fucking hated these things they just there was something very otherworldly about their movements which after seeing the documentary of like how it all made how this is all put together it makes amazing sense and now as an adult i really have a love for the artistry that went into it and just the whole creative process and the amount of detail and care that was put into it but i don't know why as a child that freaked me out yeah they were they were scary um there is a danger about them one of the things because even when i was a kid i was like this is not my favorite part i don't like these as much um, but there is one that I liked because he looked the nicest out of all of them, the kindest out of all of them. And, um, we, we encounter the fireys who can basically take off parts of their body, their heads, anything can come off. Um, almost as they may as well be like a fucking Halloween skeleton. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like they have no cares. They have no worries. And that's really what their song is about too, is like, just let it all go, you know, just quote chilly down um you know take off your head doesn't matter everything's fine it'll just be fine but uh i also found this scary because they have a similar facial feature like the bumpiness to the skexies yeah and i don't like those um especially the snotty ones that are so so yeah see weirdly nothing in dark crystal bothered me at all but the the fire is dead it was the gooey ones that were so so <laughs> gross Blah, nasty um i don't uh, snotty yeah no. <laughs> so these guys are dry they're yeah. you know they they're fluffy they're feathery actually kind of look like koosh balls with arms yeah um and they're all singing um but the cool thing is the way that this was filmed is they had multiple different um types of puppeteering that was going on uh, some of them actually were just the head. Some of them handled like an arm and a leg and they were tied to the actual puppeteers, various things along those lines. Um, but the puppeteers had to be in all black velvet and they were on a stage of all black velvet, which is how it was first filmed. Then they took away all the velvet. They um, actually were using computers at this time to keep the cameras on the same track to do the exact same movements and then they cut them together so that you would see the background with the fireys in the forest um, with the fireys on top of that which is why you have that sort of outline that looks a little bit different and this is before green screens very cool but black velvet was like the darkest substance yeah so that's what they used that's super cool now i'm going to tell you something that i don't think you knew hmm the voice of Fiery number three and number four apparently is Danny John Jules. Really? Yep. No shit. <laughs> yep. Fucking small world. I know. Um, and we love Danny John Jules from a couple of things. We love him as Cat. Yes, uh, from Red Dwarf. And I, I love him. <laughs> also, uh, from of course all of my murder mystery shows, but most especially Death in Paradise. Where yes. He is one of my favorite characters. Which of all your murder mystery shows is one of the ones I don't mind. At least the first few seasons. I like the first two inspectors. Uh, the third guy is kind of eh to me, but I really like Richard was the first guy. Richard is the first. Yeah. Hopefully and then, the uh, yeah. And the second guy, I, 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 he's fine. They, uh, he grows on me a little bit, but definitely I'm always down to watch like a Richard episode. The yeah. second guy. Yeah, sure. I'll, I might pay attention, but anyone else I'm, I really didn't. Eh. It's like the Doctor Principal, I guess. I, I know it's hard because it 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 is a change like the Doctor, but they're not being the exact same character. They're being a version of uh, a detective who's living on this island and solving these murders. Never go to, never go to Saint Marie. Never. <laughs> it's the same thing as going to Cabot Cove. You never want to go to any of these places or um, anywhere in Midsummer. Never, never, never. Too many friggin' murders there. Why would? The murder per capita is way too high. <laughs> so <laughs> the murder is too damn high. <laughs> so um, yeah, so Danny John Jules is the voice of Fiery Three and Four. Now something else that is listed on their wiki, but I can't I can't confirm it yet. Uh, they said that 
Danny John Jules actually, after Bowie's death, um, leaked, quote, leaked the Wild Things song, which was the original version, the unreleased version of the Fiery song. Huh. Yes. So he, quote, leaked it. And I'm like, ah. But there are some really cool photos if you look up on YouTube, um, Wild Things, uh, specifically from Labyrinth, because if you look up Wild Things, you're going to get a whole host of who knows what. Wild Things. But um, there's a photo of uh, that flashes through the video of um, Danny John Jules and <laughs> David Bowie. Full baby face. And he's he's got the, the babiest baby face. I mean, David Bowie's baby face was also baby face at that point, too. It was the freaking 80s. But, but especially because that was yes. technically pre-cat at that point still. Was it really? When was... Um, I want to... Oh, man, I want to say like 88, 89 was Red Dwarf. So yeah, Because I know it was a few that. years before it came to the U.S., which is how I caught it, was as a wee lad on, oh, fuck, I think PBS maybe is what had uh, Red Dwarf airing on TV. Yeah, it, was, it says 19, uh, 1988. Yeah. Interesting. I'm actually impressed I remembered that, because usually I'm shit at remembering dates. <laughs> the first episode date says March 29th, 1989 for the U.S. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah, so Danny John Jules, we love him um, and seem to find him in various other things that have popped up. We had him on something else, too, that oh. he came across. Fuck, what was it? Now I don't remember. It'll come to us, like, at the end, I'm sure. Or it'll be 3 a.m. when one of us gets up to pee. It's like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, one of us smacks the end. What is that thing? <laughs> also, with the other thing that I hate because the faces aren't right. Um, <laughs> we'll do both at the same time. But... Um, there's the fiery scene and they are like, well, you know, you're supposed to take off your head. Well, we'll take off your head. So it gets to be to a point where instead of being, you know, kind of fun and kind of go lucky, they're just now getting malicious. Yeah. And she's like, I got to get out of here. You know, my head doesn't come off. I have to leave. So she's running away trying to get out and she's basically screaming for help at this point. While this is happening, while she's in the forest, Hoggle is off basically mumbling to himself about how, you know, get through the labyrinth. She'll never get through the labyrinth. And um, talking to himself as I tend to do uh, basically all day, every day in the house. Well, you need expert advice. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Um, that's good. Uh, so that's when uh, Jareth actually pops up and is like, uh, what's going on? What's happening? And he's like, uh, nothing. I, um, I lost her. Then he's like, oh, okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to give you something and you're going to give this to her when you find her again. Um, and, uh, Hoggle is like, oh, oh, I hear her. I hear her calling. I'm just going to go and take her back to the beginning. You know, like you told me, um, and uh, Jareth gives him instead a peach to give to her that was once uh, um, a ball. Yes. Um, One of the crystal balls thank there. Thank you. Why can't I think of crystal? I'm like glass. It was a glass <laughs> ball. It's a crystal ball. It's supposed to be. You know, that can also be bubbles, uh, we find out. Um, but Which are honestly like one of the few terrible looking CG effects in the film. Is the transition yeah. from the bubble to being an actual crystal ball. Yeah, I thought you were going to say, like, the ballroom scene that we're going to get to in a second. And I was like, that's that's practical. They put, like... No, 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 no. Like, like the th there's so many scenes where he's... There's a CG bubble in his hand, yeah. and then it cuts to when they have the actor or the uh, juggler, juggler behind him yeah. there, uh, you know, tickling his balls. Oh, God, <laughs> yeah. Um, amazing that that juggler can do that, though. Like completely blind he's yeah. flying blind he's just an arm uh and he's able to juggle these crystal balls it's it's incredible fucking wild um it was so disappointing when i realized that it wasn't david bowie that did that 
Um, I mean, reasonable. Imagine how long it would have taken for him to master that. Well, yeah, of course. But as a child, I was like, he's amazing. <laughs> he is so amazing. And then I got older and I was like, okay, he's good at standing. He can stand. <laughs> and there's a juggler. Uh, but, uh, yeah, amazing, amazing job. We actually had a juggler when I was a kid that came to our school and basically did that. And I was like, oh, he can do the thing like Labyrinth. <laughs> um, it was, it was very cool. Uh, but the, um, uh, Hoggle goes and helps Sarah. But before he does, Jareth says, hey, if she ever kisses you, I'll turn you into prince. I'll turn you into a prince. And he says, really? He's like, yeah, prince of the land of stench. Because he's already... <laughs> threatened him to send him to the Bog of Eternal Stench. And he's like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> really funny, King. Uh, and he goes off to basically save Sarah. And it's also, again, one of the few moments where he actually seems like he's kind of having fun, Jareth, that is. Oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, I can at least fuck with Hoggle. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he never remembers his name. Sarah had a hard time with Hoggle's name as well. Um, yeah, he calls him, like, uh, Hog Breath, uh, Hog Brain. Hog Head, yeah. Calls him all different things. Um, and Hoggle every time is just kind of like, Hoggle? Like, he <laughs> corrects him, but not sternly. Yeah. Um, so Hoggle goes and gets Sarah out of the, the forest, basically climbs up a wall. Um, and she's like, thank you so much. And he's like, don't kiss me. Just don't kiss me. Because she's going to, like, hug him and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so she ends up planting one on him somewhere, and they're both sent. Whist away. Just as everything else, uh, through a trap door, and set into the the bog of eternal stench, and she lands, and she's like, "Oh God, it smells!" While uh, the the bog has a bunch of what do, Farts. sphincters <laughs> that are opening and closing and making <laughs> fart noises. So I mean, if you've got a kid that's into fart sounds, this is definitely something you should show them. Um, <laughs> Because some of them are a little funny, even even for me when I'm just I've kind of over a lot of the fart jokes. But um, yeah, it's it smells bad apparently, and if you step foot in it, you're gonna smell bad for the rest of your life. Yeah, but, no amount of cleaning will get that off. Yeah, but they also then encounter Ludo, Ludo who is now accidentally sitting on Hoggle, um, and Hoggle now for the first time meets Ludo, and they're like all friends, and and Hoggle's like, "What did you call him?" <laughs> And he's like, oh, okay, sure. Uh, but then they also are going to try and cross over this, um, like, rivery sort of bog. Um, there's a, a not very good looking bridge, but it's all that is really there. And as they're heading over, we encounter another one of my favorite characters. This is my absolute favorite character. My aunt had a cat named Didymus. That is amazing. I know, I love the name. So we encounter Sir Didymus. Uh, and Sir Didymus is like, um, uh, a fox, uh, an anthropomorphic fox who, uh, has, um, a sheepdog as his, <laughs> as his noble steed, yes. Ambrosius. Very, very much like the dog that Sarah has at the beginning of the film. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this will also switch between being a puppet and an actual dog, um, that has a fox rider on it. But he has a, a starter, um, basically a, a crop with um, a metal bit on the end of it. Uh, yeah, it looks more like a just outright cane at times. Pretty much. And uh, in order to cross, um, Didymus has this, like, uh, none may cross without my permission. That's what he's promised. Yeah. So... He starts having this battle with Ludo, and they are going through fighting each other until um, they come to a standstill. Yeah, and it almost harkens to the same kind of energy of, like, uh, Princess Bride, yes. uh, where Dread Pirate Roberts and uh, Nego are kind of fighting. And, you know, you could tell that Ludo's, like, not really into it, but he's not having a bad time either. Yeah. And Sir Didymus is out, like, ah, you finally a worthy challenge! Yes. Uh, <laughs> and because of that, he then considers Ludo his brother, um... And so they're like, cool, we can cross now. 
meanwhile, they're all like suffering in this stench, and uh, Didymus is like, I don't smell anything. Yeah, poor bastard's been here so long, <laughs> he just doesn't notice it anymore. No, his, he's gone nose blind to it, and he's like, I've got a fine, a keen sense of smell, and I don't smell anything. There's something wrong with you. And then um, she's like, uh, so Sarah's like, cool, let's go. Uh, but uh, Didymus is like, well, no, you're forgetting my vow. And she's like, well, okay, what exactly did you promise? And he says, well, none may cross without my permission. And she's like, so do we have your permission? And he's, for a sec, he's like, uh, yes. Like, like, thank you. <laughs> and one, it, it's the beautiful kind of realization of all of her lessons up to this point. Yep. Where she has finally understood to ask the right questions. Yep. But also, I love it from his perspective as well, because clearly that thought had never crossed his mind until that moment. Like, nope. oh, wait, sure, yeah, fuck it, let's go. Yeah. And I, I fucking love Sir Didymus, and I, I pointed this out to you because, uh, I, as, as we've talked about on this podcast, uh, there are two similar, although slightly different character archetypes that I really fucking love, and that's Valkyries and Unga Bunga types. <laughs> uh, and I think, honestly, as I think back into the annals of my uh, child brain uh, in through my formative years, watching this a lot, and as much as I did, probably the origin of my love of Unga Bunga characters probably came from Sir Dynamis. I do love him. Because while he does have a weirdly distinct sense of an honor code... Motherfucker's just ready to throw hands at a moment's notice. Absolutely. And has, like, no concern for self-safety either. No. Doesn't matter what he's fighting, the size, the amount, there's just a charisma, a natural energy that goes, no, you're gonna lose. Yeah. And, and we'll talk more about one of my favorite scenes of that later. Uh, but no, motherfucker's just always ready to throw hands. And it's like, maybe this is the origin point of why I love Unga Bunga characters. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so they go, they're like, cool, we're going to get out of here. They try and cross the bridge, but the bridge falls down. Um, but Sarah is holding on to, like, a branch of a of a kind of dilapidated tree above her. Um, I guess rotten sort of tree. It's, it's very much, um, this section gives bog. Uh, so it is the bog of eternal stench. But if you're thinking, it's also kind of like um, swamp, I would yeah. say. Uh, so mossy areas, those types of things. Yeah, very kind of like dead Floridian swamp. Exactly. So she's holding on to a pretty sturdy, although not looking like it's going to hold on much longer, kind of branch. Um, and she's a little bit panicked. No one really wants to fall into that bog. So Ludo starts doing his thing and starts calling the rocks. And up from uh, the bottom of this bog come these rocks. So she's able to stand on them especially the one underneath her right away, and then he calls up some more, and that's when um, uh, kind of the rest of the group also realizes and learns that Ludo can call the rocks. And um, Didymus is like, Oh, Ludo, canst thou summon up the very rocks? And he's like, sure, rocks friends. <laughs> so um, they, they all, you know, make their way across Ludo, and every time one of the rocks is stepped on, it makes a farty noise. So Ludo makes his way across, and they're all, like, big and long and deep farty noises. But then Didymus <laughs> makes his way across on Ambrosius, and it's all these little put-put-put-put noises. <laughs> and the little put-put-put noises always crack me up. I, it's so stupid. But um, it, it's a fart noise section. So um, Hoggle was the first one to run across. And kind of did so before all the fighting really happened, thinking he was just going to escape it. Didn't really, you know, isn't a brave person. Yeah. So, makes his way across, um, but he comes back to help them off of these rocks. He still has the peach. Um, and while everyone is walking away, leaving the section, he goes like he's going to drop the peach in the bog. But we hear this voiceover of uh, Jareth saying, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Because he can see. He can see what's yeah. going on, and he's monitoring the situation. And so Hoggle's, you know, a bit defeated. Now, they're all walking through the forest away from this section, and they're they're all saying how they're kind of hungry now. Um, and Sarah's like, well, maybe we can find some berries. But Ludo has gone off, um, Didymus has gone off, and it's only Sarah and Hoggle kind of falling behind. And Hoggle's 
just kind of very softly says her name and and hands her the peach and she's like oh you're a lifesaver she bites into it and she's like wow i'm not feeling so good i feel funny um yeah, she's like you know where, where did you find this like not accusatory at all just like oh something's weird here but he starts like backing off very like worried and scared and then she's like hoggle what did you do yeah and he's like damn you jareth and damn me too which i fucking love that line delivery it's so good um and so he basically goes off to to leave her and so she is laying against a tree and this is where we see another one of those moments of the bubbles um or the crystal balls turning into the bubbles but a great scene of the juggling yes. of those crystal balls where it's then um, sent off to to Sarah, kind of in like a dream sequence. So she's bitten into this crystal ball that was tricked into, she was tricked into eating it um, or eating this dream, this, um, this gift that Jareth is giving her. Which the sequence that uh, unfolds, Again, when I was younger, I'm like, oh, this is like a really cool sequence. There's a lot, uh, you know, a lot of interesting elements to it. And while there is, it's a scene that's now made very uncomfortable. Uh, again, now realizing just how young she is. There and is, also yeah. with the added commentary in the documentary. <laughs> oh, you mean the David Bowie commentary? That one forgets she's only 14? Yeah, followed by Jim Henson even outright saying, oh yeah, no, there's meant to be, you know, a, 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 a mature lure to all this of like, clearly she's in an area that she knows is, you know, too old for her and yet she wants to be so badly a part of it. It's like, ugh, this, this is skeevy. Uh, I don't it's like this. It's very skeevy. I mean, she's been tricked into taking a bite of a peach, like this is a, there's a lot of trickery and things that are not good and yes that's part of fairy tales and shit and it's usually done with younger people and you could argue that she is supposed to be of an age like 16 although she's portrayed by someone who is actually 14 you never know at this point because it doesn't say that she's supposed to be a 16 year old girl she is a 14 year old actress yeah so um, I'm just going to go by the assume because the movie makes no effort to tell no. me what she's supposed to be. So I'm just going to go off the assumption that she is a child. She, Yeah, she is not of age, that's for yeah, sure. Certainly so, not of age. I mean, 16 is still a child. Don't get my statement wrong there. Uh, but there's also still a very big difference between a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. Yeah, a 16-year-old can have permission to work if your parents say so. So can a 14-year-old, actually. Really? In Maine? Yes. Uh, that's when I first started working was 14. Uh, you have to get a permit through the Department of Labor signed by a parent. Oh, for us, I think it was 16. I did not grow up in this state. Yeah, no. Uh, after 16, you don't need any kind of uh, permission or anything, but at 14, you can start working. Oh, I did not know that. And that's when I got my first mitt job. Da -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Fun. Um, so, Sarah uh, is bewitched by this peach and by a floating bubble that comes in that's showing her this ballroom scene um, where she is dressed in this extravagant, poofy... It's actually, so it's, fucking poofy. It, but it's so beautiful. It's um, a gorgeous dress, but like I forgot so how 80s. ridiculous the shoulder pieces were. It's so 80s. <laughs> Everything about it is so 80s. Her hair is giant, um, but she, she looks absolutely beautiful she looks yes. she's she looks exactly like one of the dolls that she has in her room um truly princess box. comes to mind looking yes. at her in this get up absolutely uh and she encounters this um this ball and it's being held in a bubble basically uh where all of these adults are dressed as goblins um that's what all their masks are. They're playing at being goblins. Yeah, it's kind of like a masquerade ball aesthetic. Exactly. And um, so their costumes are also big and poofy and extravagant. Um, their masks are big and poofy and extravagant. Um, oversized. Like, everything is oversized. Um, and the mask designs are honestly phenomenal. I was really glad they, they went into more detail about that in the documentary because... I just, I love the aesthetic detail in those. Such fantastic touches for something that really you see for so little amount of time comparatively. Yes, and I like that there were changes into the shapes of the goblins as well. Um, goblin is, 
I don't want to go too far down this this path, but um, a lot of negative portrayals of things, witches, goblins, everything like that, have what would be considered large hooked noses, uh, and essentially the features of what um, the Jewish community have said are these are features that are anti-Semitic. If you're if you keep doing this, this is anti-Semitic. Yeah, and there are. Some masks that have the larger noses, but many of them also have just, like, larger ears or larger eyes, um, tiny little button noses. Um, they're all different styles, which is something that I enjoyed because it's not portraying one or another as always being a goblin. Yeah. Um, and so I felt like this is one, from an outsider's perspective, again, that is, as I've mentioned before, I am an outsider, and it is an outsider's perspective, but... Um, it's much, much less, um, I would say, hate-filled and more stylistically incorporating all types. Yes, it, it very much feels like it's actually going for a kind of fairy tale aesthetic versus a let's thinly veil some racism into here kind of feel. Exactly. So um, I, I love the costume designs. I've made my own uh, mask for myself. I've also been in a parade uh, as one of the the masquerade ball people so i i truly love it and the one thing that we encounter here though is that we feel with sarah as outsiders yeah we are not part of this she is not a part of this and they make her feel that way they like play tricks on her um they're also sexual towards each other in certain ways i would say but not nearly as overtly as um, other things, I guess. Um, other portrayals, there are other things that people have taken and run with it, like um, precursors uh, and like a return to the labyrinth kind of a thing. Um, and other stories that people have, not just fan fiction, um, but like actual stories that have gone along with it. And yeah. they've made it way more sexual than what we see here. But there is that underlying adult feel to it. Um and it's one of the reasons why they actually chose David Bowie, too, is because of his ability to be not only a pop star, but the sexuality behind him and his adult sort of realm that he lives in. Yeah, there's an ethereal attractiveness just naturally about David Bowie. So, yeah. so um, Sarah is catching glimpses of David Bowie here and there, um, or Jareth, in uh, the costumes in this section are just so amazing. And I pointed out to you, I'm like, look at the coat! Look at his coat! Yes. <laughs> I, I that is it. a gorgeous coat. It's it's truly incredible. Um, and I'm sure it's got a bunch of all these little jewels on it that really only show up well on screen. I've actually seen it in real life. It is still gorgeous. But um, they show up really well on screen when they're well lit. Um, I've seen pretty much all of the costumes. I think Sarah's dress was part of it. Um... It was, it was, a lot of it was on display with all the characters. I was going to say, yeah, because you have some stuff that's actually autographed by the cast, right? Uh, I don't think from them. Oh, not from them? I, I did see, uh, Karen Prell, who is the junk lady, but I don't think I have something autographed by them. I did have, I did have, um, uh, a book, a, a Kermit the Frog book that I think was autographed maybe by her. Maybe. I don't I don't remember. I might. I don't remember now at this point. Um but I did sit in a throne that they made for like the 30th anniversary of uh, uh, Jareth's throne. It's it, it's a lot. I I've loved this for a very long time. We don't have to get into all of it. But um <laughs> seeing as how I'm probably taking us through way too much anyway. So, um in this then uh, Sarah keeps searching for Jareth until she finds him and well he finds her, lets her find him. And then does this sort of ballroom dance of um, uh, very flowy motions. Yes. Very cool. Um, which the the choreography is done uh, by Cheryl Gates McFadden. Cheryl McFadden, Cheryl Gates McFadden, or Gates McFadden, is Dr. Beverly Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation. No! Yes, and she goes by two different names when she's doing choreography, I guess, versus acting. So Cheryl McFadden or Gates McFadden. And that's when I was like, I know her face when we were watching the um, the Inside the Labyrinth thing. I'm like, I know her. Oh, shit. Yes. All right. 
So Dr. Beverly Crusher crushing it with this choreography. Fucking A, all right. Yeah, they have another choreographer as well, and I can't remember his name, but um, he does an amazing job too. He did it uh, a great job with uh, David Bowie in the Dance Magic song as well yes. as um, the Fireys as well. So uh, it's not just her, but uh, in this scene, she was a major player. So great job with it. Um, beautiful kind of sweeping motions which feel ethereal as well. And being in a bubble, it kind of makes sense that it's a little swishy, it's a little swashy. Yeah. So, uh, but Sarah kind of realizes that this isn't where she's supposed to be. And she breaks through the bubble. Um, and she is no longer a bubble girl. She is no longer a bubble girl. So she falls uh, out of the bubble and she lands in a junkyard, which is where we encounter the junk lady, um, which is amazing. Uh, I, I didn't show you how that operates, but there's someone like on the inside um, who is operating the whole th it, It's very cool. Mm. Um, but uh, the chunk lady has all of the things that she cares about on her back and takes Sarah to a section that looks like Sarah's room. And Sarah thinks, oh, I've just been sleeping this entire time. But then she goes to leave to see if her father is back but encounters the junk lady again, and then she's scared. And at this point, she's forgetting, because she ate the peach, and she's forgetting what's happened. That was kind of the whole deal, of like, if you take this crystal ball, you know, you're never going to have to remember all of this, nothing's going to be an issue for you. Yeah. She ate the peach that was a crystal ball, she's forgetting. Um, but the junk lady starts piling all of these things in her room on her, like, here's your Betsy Boo doll, you know, you always loved your Betsy Boo doll. And Sarah's sitting there and she sees the labyrinth book and she's kind of thinking to herself, like, what? I'm missing something. I think I lost something. And something that I also really appreciate about this scene is you see the first glimpses of this in the initial scene when she's in her room at the beginning of the movie. But this scene gives you a better chance to, like, really look in and observe at a lot of the things she had in her room. There's so much a of the labyrinth that's represented in her room. Yep. Uh, like, she has a statue of Jareth. Uh, yes. There's a lot of stuffed animals and stuff in the background that represent a lot of creatures we'll come across. Uh, and it, it, I feel like it goes very quick when we're at, in her actual room, but getting the second chance to see it and also now having the associations made, it makes it far easier to point out in this segment. Exactly. She also has um, a cat's poster in there. She's got Grimm's fairy tales, um, Alice in Wonderland. She has um, where the wild things are, something that we cross over in the beginning as well. Um, and the M.C. Escher relativity um, uh, painting sketch drawing Yes. Uh, of all of the staircases, which is important uh, in multiple ways. But the... Um, the junk lady is trying to pile all these things on Sarah, and Sarah says, well, it's all junk. And the junk lady's like, what? No. And hands her uh, the the doll on the music box, and she's like, what about this? This isn't junk. And Sarah's like, yes, it is. And she throws it down, and everything starts crumbling around her. And she realizes, oh, I have to save Toby. So she then gets um, to like get on her vanity table and tries to climb out, or figure out a way out, and her friends are calling for her. So she eventually climbs out with her friend's help, and Hoggle, who has made his way also to the junkyard, is like, oh, oh, crap, and sees that she has now made her way out, and is kind of like, come on, you know, we're, we're going to go, but he's still hiding away, because he is ashamed. It's very ashamed, yeah. Um, so... Uh, this is where we also encounter um, Didymus in his most, I would say, ungabunga state. <laughs> um, his uh, he starts smacking the guards in front of. Yeah, they're just kind of like napping. He's like, "All right, fuck it, let's let's Wake go." Up. <laughs> And then she's like, no, no, we could sneak past them. Fuck sneaking! And just starts whacking them right out. Like, Let's go! We gotta fight! And she's like, cut it out! Stop, stop, stop! And he's like, well, but but, but I'm brave, and, and, and my, my sense of smell is keen. And she's like, yes! And I'll fight anyone, anywhere, anytime, any place. And she's like, yes, yes, just shush, shush! So um, they end up making it into, like, the first um, 
section. If you were to think of it as like a drawbridge, it would be like um, the drawbridge opens, but there's a section that has uh, the in-between where you could have a gate and close that off to be a little bit more protected, but also stop someone from leaving. Yeah, kind of um, like an airlock kind of idea. Yeah, and so they get into that section um, and... Portcullis, that's the word. There we go. And so then the two giant gates start closing and we encounter now the, um, what they call humongous. Yes. Which I think is such a perfect thing. Um, but it is their biggest puppet that they had made up until this point. And um, my ears just popped. And um, it's... It's, it's really a giant cool. robot. It's a giant <laughs> robot that comes together in a couple of pieces um, and it's controlled in world by a little goblin on top. Um, but it is controlled by a person with a bunch of freaking hydraulics. It's amazing. I truly was just engineered at a youthful age to love giant robots. It's true. It's true. Between this, Iron Giant, and so many other things. Oh my god. Uh, I will cry and cry when we do Iron Giant. <laughs> So, um, but who names our kid Hogarth? That's a very good. I mean, it's set in Maine, so clearly. Uh, Is it really? Yes, I didn't remember it's that. set in uh, Rockwell. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, the statue at the beginning of the movie uh, has the Rockwell Maine. I did not notice that, or certainly didn't remember it. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, so honestly, really, it should be called uh, Hogarth. If, yeah. Hey, Hogath. Hey, fucking hey, bab. Yeah, there is no R in there. You throw R's in the wrong places and take them out of other words and put them in there. Got an idea there, bub. Our dear, yeah. Virginia. Oh, I hate my people sometimes. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, we'll get you out of this state eventually. Um, maybe. Maybe. So, uh, then they're kind of stuck. Um, they're... They have these um, spikes that come up behind them because they are considered an assault on the town that is around the center of the labyrinth. Yeah. Um, the city. And uh, we we have Ambrosius, uh, who is hiding as best as possible. And didn't miss it having it. He's like, come out here now. Come on. Um, we have hands to throw. Come on, Doug. Basically. Uh, but Hoggle comes in and kind of saves the day and um, jumps on the the humongous and um, takes over but doesn't know how to drive it. So basically makes it explode. Um, it gets the axe uh, stuck axe into stuck. the back of the, the top of the portcullis. Yep. And in doing so... Um, because it gets stuck, all of its mechanisms then kind of overexert themselves and um, uh, overworks it, and so explode a little bit. But <laughs> Hoggle jumps out of it and lands, you know, flat on his face. And we have, you know, the meeting of Sarah and Hoggle again, where he's like, "I, I don't care. You know, I don't, I don't have any interest in being friends. I." I'm not sorry for what I've done, and, and you know, I, I kind of had to do these things, and, you know, I'm a coward. Um, and she's like, I forgive you. It's fine. <laughs> you you kind of had to do what you had to do. Um, and so they now are able to make their way into the actual city. Did you think that betraying me, do you think I think so little of you that betraying me would make me not like you anymore? Oh, or whatever God. the fuck the phrase was. Yeah. Um, we're at all at the same time going through uh, the Capaldi Doctor Who's and we have many thoughts on it, but I needed David to go with me down the journey because I have many thoughts and I needed someone who was logical enough to discuss them with me. Yeah, because I, I stopped basically when Capaldi started. I stopped right after that Christmas special uh, of all the Doctors there. Uh, and I had adored Doctor Who. And I, I don't know why. I just was like, you know, I kind of need a break from it. Because I, I think it's just because I binge so much between the show as it was happening for the modern stuff. And for a while, Netflix had a lot of the old stuff from the fourth Doctor and the sixth Doctor and whatnot uh, on there. And so I binged all those as well that uh, they had. And so I think I was just Doctor Who'd out. And, uh, it just happened to coincide when Capaldi took over. And um, I think that Capaldi, I know that this is not what we're talking about, but I think that Capaldi uh, really had. Um, been cheated out of his run of Doctor Who. Yep. 
Um, and uh, I think that the focus was not on his journey. It was on another's journey. And uh, because of it, I don't think that he got a fair shake. And I actually really like his doctor. I like his doctor, too. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get back to Labyrinth in a second. Just to, you know, summarize my thoughts here on Doctor Who for Capaldi's run so far. We're just getting into... We just finished the first two episodes of the second season with him. Uh, I think it's The Magician's Apprentice and uh, The Witches something. I can't remember. I uh, don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but... I like Capaldi's doctor when he's allowed to actually be the doctor and not just be basically the companion to his companion. Mm -hmm. And they pick the wrong person to be the companion. I should have gotten rid of the companion. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but yes. Uh, so, so that, that's, that's, anyways, <laughs> getting back to Labyrinth. So, uh, um, <laughs> it's at this point that one of the goblins comes in to... Um, David Bowie and is like, uh, hey, you remember that girl who ate the peach and forgot everything? And he's like, yeah, what about her? Well, she's here and she's, you know, in the Goblin City. And he's like, what? And so he says, you know, take the baby, hide it. Um, where are the guards? You know, get everyone out there. Um, and we've had multiple cuts to David Bowie throughout this. And a lot of it is sort of humorous or we get a song that goes along with it, um, which the songs in this are, you know, phenomenal. Really? I... I'm a little biased, though, because I grew up with them. The songs are fucking bops, but you and I discussed this uh, recently where uh, Dance Magic, as we mentioned earlier, it's a good song, but it does the cardinal sin that you and I both have towards musicals where the song doesn't actually progress the story in any way. It's just a yep. fluff piece. All of them are. Except maybe Underground. Yeah, Underground, I'd argue, is relevant for the plot. It doesn't... But it's at the beginning and the end, so it doesn't really do anything for us. That's true. It's more of a... The kind Fireys, of like a maybe. Maybe the Fireys. Yeah. Fireys are... Actually, That that's probably the one song that actually progresses the plot forward. Yeah. Is the Fireys song. So, yeah, because... Underground... Yeah. Yeah, none of the songs in this actually, except for the Fireys one. Maybe, maybe the... Um, the one in the staircases for the confrontation bit. yeah but not not a hundred percent because it doesn't really do too much other than like how you turn my world you precious thing all of these things like it, he's kind of having a conversation but it doesn't it, it's it sets kind of, the it's, mood yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it sets the mood but it doesn't move the story yeah um but you get a little bit more about kind of his emotion there. Yeah. So, um, we, we have a battle, uh, it ranged all over. Both were masters. Um, that's a, that's a Princess Bride reference right there, <laughs> just in case anyone didn't know. Um, the loser ran off alone. The winner followed those print footprints toward Gilda. <laughs> um, so anyway. We, we have a battle um, where we see Ludo with his rocks. We see Didymus basically I, off on his own. And I figured that there was something you wanted to reference here. I, I, it's my favorite fucking instance of his Unga Bunga nature. Where there's a point where there's two like major fights with him. We have one scene where it's him kind of jousting against another. Yep. And it's really the best scene we get to see of his actual skill. Because we either see scenes of him just rat a tat tatting on people, or we get like a build up to him getting to get in there, but he doesn't really get to. Yeah. So the jousting is like the like real good moment we get to see of skill and technique. Because that was a big thing with jousting is there's a lot of like mental math that goes into that timing, uh, you know, direction of the lance, keeping in mind the speed of your horse and their horse, etc. So we get to see a little bit of that uh, fight mentality proper in there to show he's not just pure unga bunga. There's skill with it as well. Right. Uh, but my favorite is they uh, uh, shortly after that they're starting to like crowd him and surround him, and there's like thirty of these fuckers that have his back to a wall. Uh, and he's like, all right, I'm going to give you all a chance to surrender. This this is your moment. Put put your weapons down, and I promise that you will be kept safely as prisoners. And I just, I 
fucking love it. Because, again, there's not a doubt in his mind that he's going to tear through this fucking crowd yeah. the second they decide not to lay down their weapons. Yeah. No, and I, the fu- I promise you'll be well treated. And my favorite part is the fact they don't show the follow-up to that. Nope. So we could just presume he fucking tore through that crowd after. What happens after that, though, are, like, the rocks and things. I like to presume he tore oh, through right. that crowd and sure. then the rocks happened. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of rocks, there's a lot of really cool different goblins and different, um, uh, fighting type of mechanics. Um, there is one that kind of shoots like it is almost like a... A turret. Like a, almost. Yeah. It, I don't like that one, but there are a lot of the other ones that are really kind of cool. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, like, um, uh, cannonball fire. And the cannonballs are alive. And, like, the gun one wouldn't have bothered me as much if it felt more flintlock. Sure. And less of, like, an actual machine gun. Yeah. Like, like because if Because everything is is not modern. It's no. older. This, this is a modern girl going through a town that is in the past. Like, this... I don't think that they've kidnapped a baby for a, quite a while. Yeah. So I I agree, um, it it felt very machine gun. It didn't have the same feel as the others. That's really the only one that I don't like. Yeah, it, it just felt out of place compared to everything else we've seen visually up to this point. Exactly, um, but they make their way through. Uh, they tear open a, a house to let Ludo in, and he calls all the rocks, and um, the rocks help. So. Then they get to the castle at the center of the labyrinth, and that's when Sarah says, hey, actually, I kind of have to do this on my own. And they're like, but why? She's like, I don't know, because that's why it's done. That's the way it's done. And they're like, well, okay, if you need us, let us know. And I love that moment because I, I just, I also just genuinely love that archetype. I've talked about it before on the podcast, but anytime it's like, no, we're going to have this one-on-one encounter. Uh, you know, I, I, I just love the build up for that. I don't know why. It always makes it feel more dramatic when you do have the kind of one on one finale there. Only if it makes sense to me, then fine. But if you have a group of people, because we've talked about this before Fair. too, if we have a group of people that are fighting and then they're like, nah, it is now up to you, one person of our party. And then, oh, well, maybe you failed. It is now up to me, another member of our party. So the Yu Yu Hakusho versus Demon Slayer principle, where Demon Slayer is willing to be like, fuck it, we're all going in, we're all going ham on this beast. Yes. Uh, where Yu Yu Hakusho, everyone has too much pride. It's like, no, 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 well, you can go. Quick spoilers for Yu Yu Hakusho, I guess, real quick. Uh, but that, that's... That also shows my love of the conviction of where the characters pride and like where their breaking points come from though. Because in the dark tournament when they thought Tagoro was about to kill Yusuke, that's the one time that they all and we see it actually happen later on with the chapter Black Saga, where, you know, we get the tease of it when Tagoro's about to kill Yusuke, where all three of them are like, no, he fucking kills Yusuke. We're fucking tearing this place apart. We don't care. All these other demons and officials wanna throw a fit about it, we'll kill all of them too. Mm-hmm. And they're all fucking ready to do it. And then we actually see that happen with Yusuke's death at the hands of Sensui, and all three of them, no, fuck it, world doesn't matter anymore, we're killing this motherfucker. Uh, and I, 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 I love that because it shows that while they all have their stupidly fucking frustrating forms of, like, order and their own kind of conv- moral convictions and moral codes, there is still a certain limit that will break them over that, and Friendship is that limit. Mm-hmm. But the uh, friends we made <laughs> along the way. So Sarah goes to have her final confrontation, but doesn't find him in uh, like his throned area. So she has to go find another section. Yeah, she finds a bunch of chimkins that will never act in this town again. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. It is still one of my favorite things, and I never quote the line correctly, but I will quote it correctly. Um... In the the making of, like, the inside the labyrinth, um, Jim Henson is trying to get, like, a scrawny chicken in the shot. And chickens like to group together, especially when they're being filmed, apparently. 
And so all of the handlers are trying to get, like, just one chicken to be on its own in there. <laughs> and the one chicken is like, I am alone. I don't like this at all. And it is like, no, I'm, I'm going to nope right out of the situation. <laughs> So then it goes to the very top of the um, the construction that they've made for this section of the labyrinth that they're filming down. It's like this little corridor. And so Henson's sitting there and he's laughing and he's like, this chicken will never be a star. Um, and to <laughs> me, I always misquote it as this chicken will never be an actor, um, which is just, you know, echolalia wise, something that pops up in my brain constantly. But it's this chicken will never be a star. You know what popped up into my brain uh, when I was watching that bit in the documentary? What? Chicken chaser! Chicken chaser. <laughs> Do the chickens run? Oh, chicken chaser. <laughs> um, which, if we haven't said it before or enough, was my favorite game. One day we'll do it for the podcast. We'll, we'll eventually do Fable. Because we'll I have one not... Or all of the Fables. Because I have not fully played through Fable 1 in years. <laughs> Oh. Like, I genuinely don't... Uh, I think the last time I replayed through Fable 1 was right before Fable 2 came out. <laughs> okay. So it's it's been a while. It's been a while. Um, and I will, like, forever play it. And if I don't play it, I will put on um, a YouTube of someone else playing it. <laughs> um, but it's one of those games that you can get lost in because you can do stuff in world that you don't have to just, you know, always follow the path. You can do some weird stuff like yeah. i'm just gonna go fish for the day i'm just gonna go beat up some beetles whatever you're gonna do but whatever um so sarah then uh encounters the mc escher version of the goblin king's castle yes where toby is also kind of walking around on all of these steps um and is always just out of reach so we also have Jareth in there as well, who is singing his song about, you know, how you turn my world, you precious thing, and all of these things. Um, you know, you starve and near exhaust me. Everything I've done, I've done for you. Um, and of course, one of my favorite lines, I move the stars for no one. And it's her trying to get to Toby while also kind of avoiding Jareth. Yeah. Um, and he's toying with her like he can move around this world with ease he can go around upside down up these stairs and and backwards and she is still stuck in the reality of gravity that she is used to from our world jareth doesn't have to abide by that and toby somehow is also not really affected probably because he's not weighed down by his lack of imagination yeah um, and this set is amazing. They did an amazing job with it's this It's phenomenal, the effects. I, I love everything that went into creating the illusion of, of him perpetually moving around, because they showed, like, one scene where they actually had a stunt double that they basically fucking rocket launchered out of the side. Yes. And then pulled him back in to cut to uh, David Bowie being still behind him, which created the effect of basically him teleporting around. That's funny. I thought it was a woman. Just, I, I always registered that person, that stunt double, as a woman. Huh. Yeah. Uh, there's another one where they're basically upside down and then yeeted up to the the standing position to be in front of Sarah. Literally with, like, a single leg sling that kind of fucking pulls them right on up. I think it's a leg sling um, that goes up to the back where there was a, an actual support. Oh, was too. there? Okay. Yeah, because there's something in there. Because... From what you can quickly see in the making of it, just I just see like the boot, yes. and I didn't see anything else. I'm like, oh my god! Uh, which one thing that was highlighted by the documentary that didn't really it, it's never registered in my brain, but it gets pointed out because of the documentary. That's kind of silly in retrospect. The way they cut him, kind of going towards that section is we see him starting to do the walk towards the underneath of that, but then we get a cut of him jogging. But it makes it look like he's going up and down stairs, mm -hmm. but it's a straight path he's walking on. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but, like, I'll never unsee that now of him basically going upstairs while walking a straight line. It's because she went downstairs, so his would be upstairs. 
and that's the part, and then it's a straight line because it it cuts uh, that way. Yeah, I get, I guess. And it, there's enough time in between that I know, it, like maybe if they had like an extra half second, but it's to mirror what happened with her because she goes down the steps, he goes basically up the steps, and then onto the, the yeah, because they do cut to yeah yeah. Maybe, like you said, maybe if there was just like a couple, you know, maybe another second or two to show him actually getting on to that point, but uh. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying, but it's to mirror what's happening with her because they are on opposite sides of the staircase. And that's when he flips around. Yeah. Or supposed to flip around. So um, Sarah keeps on trying to get to Toby. Toby starts walking around um, and she eventually sees him in a certain section and she's going to take the, the leap of faith. So she is going to jump down to the section where he is, even though it is quite a distance. In her jumping, though, everything falls apart. So this is where they have their true confrontation. So her and Jareth, Jareth with his um, costume change into something that looks much more like a uh, barn owl. So yeah. there's this almost cage that comes up the back of his neck. Um, it's very uh, wing-like uh, and feathery. Quite beautiful. Like, honestly, I would, if I ever played, like, druids in a game, that's kind of the aesthetic I would like for my druid to have. Certainly, I think that uh, taking uh, the imagery of animals, absolutely, I think that's the way to go. Instead of these, like, hooded whatevers, it feels like they have to have something, some tie to the world. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a, they've done so well with all these costumes, truly. Um, and I appreciate... Uh, first off, a brunette um, lead to be uh, a brunette in in a costume, just because that was very difficult for me as a child, because everything was blonde. Especially um, in the 80s, yeah. Yep. Uh, and I was very much not blonde as a child, uh, and I am certainly not blonde right now, uh, but uh, I am also not brunette at the moment. But um, with, with Sarah being brunette is... You know, uh, something I love that it's a character that brunette ladies can play. Or yep. brunette people. I shouldn't just put it into ladies. Um, as well as her outfit is jeans, some slides, uh, nice loafers, I should say. Uh, and a, a nice poopy, kind of wet top, yeah. A poofy shirt and a vest with a hair clip. Like, she's, she's killing it for ease of costume. Um, but it's the costumes in this really are fantastic. So she is now encountering Jareth and she first off starts trying to say the words that she's supposed to, you know, which I love this whole sequence because he, the whole time he's trying to like do the one last chance of like wooing her and be like, uh, and it's the lines you perpetually say, uh, just Fuck. fear me, love yeah. me, do as I say, and I will be your slave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. And the whole time, she's basically fucking ignoring him. She's like, fuck, well, I know there's something I'm supposed to say here. What were the lines? Yep. Again, hearkening back to the fact she can never remember them in the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. And as she's standing there saying, you know, I can never remember that line. I'm like, you are an idiot. <laughs> How could you not? Um, but he's like, I've reordered time. I've done it all for you. Uh, you cowered before me. I was frightening. I've made all of these changes for you. Because he's like, I have been generous up until now. And she's like, <laughs> generous? And he's like, yeah, I did all this for you. Gaslighting 101. Um, and <laughs> telling her that all of this is, you know, to fulfill her fantasy of what he's supposed to be. Yeah. And she's like, mm, no. No, and then the the major line of it all is that he has no power over her. And in that, everything falls apart. Um, and his face goes so sad um, because uh, he can no longer have control over things for her. She has given up that. Yeah. Um, so... She has taken control of herself, of her own life, um, and then with everything falling to pieces, she is back in her home, the clock is striking, 
the barn owl that was once David Bowie is now leaving the house. And she is concerned because she's back home, but is Toby. She goes back upstairs. There's Toby in bed all asleep. You know, totally fine. And uh, she she gives Toby her teddy bear and, and says, you know, this is yours now. You you can keep Lancelot, which is what she called her teddy bear. Um, which is another kind of symbolic way of leaving the childhood behind. Yeah. Um, and so she's in her room. And while she's in her room, she is now packing away all of the childhood things. She's putting away the labyrinth book. She's putting away a lot of things that, um, not her mother's picture, which was one of the things I was watching for in this, so that it wasn't just that she was putting away her mom and everything that that would represent, but that it was the things that she was holding on to that are not of that adult world, that she's moving into that. Not everything will go away, but some of it is going to be put away. Which I feel is also a great, again, kind of call back to earlier with the junk lady. Because like you mentioned, you know, the junk lady is effectively carrying all of her worldly possessions that matter on her back. She yep. is overburdened with everything that she feels materializes her essence. Yep. And so we kind of see, you know, an indirect lesson from that even of... It's okay to let go because it's not the material that matters for her. Yeah. It is very much about, you know, her as an individual and what she wants from life. Exactly. Um, and then her her stepmother and her father come home and um, they're like, Sarah, you know, are you home? And she's like, yeah. Well, fuck else would I be? <laughs> <laughs> Refer back to our prior argument. Where else am I going to be right now? And, um, and then... We also see at this point in the mirror all of the friends that she has made saying, you know, should you need us? And she turns around and they're not there. They're just in her mirror. And so she's talking to them through her mirror. Um, you know, should you need us? Uh, you know, just kind of let us know, which is basically what they said at the end when they had last seen her. And she, when it comes to Hoggle, says, I do need you. You know, not... You know, every now and again in my life, for no reason at all, I need you. Which I think is something that I have held on to um, because of, uh, certainly growing up in the 80s it, and, you know, 90s, uh, materialism, but as well as anthropomorphic everything was everywhere. Um, and coping mechanisms we didn't know what coping mechanisms were now that we have more studies into it we know you know there's been a lot of trauma that brings this on and i'm sure gen x kids had to go through it too where you hold on to something and you don't necessarily need it all the time in your life but you hold on to certain things that you want to keep with you for me, a lot of those are movies that I loved, and I will go back to them and watch them, and I don't need them all the time, but they do represent either part of me or a memory or something that I want to relive. And I feel that in this moment, she is having that as well, where she is saying, I don't need you all of the time, but I will still come back to you when I do. Yeah. Like, you are still a part of me. This journey was a part of me, and your friendship is still there for me. Which is so uh, probably uh, right on the money for why I love this film still to this day. Because I grew up with it. I still love it. And uh, it is so ingrained in me that I think about it nearly every day. Um, you know, if you say nothing to me, I'm going to say my, my line. If you, you say... Um, <laughs> you know, fear me or if you say love me, you know, never have you told me do as I say. Um, but uh, all of these, these bits and pieces are part of, of what I've grown up having in my brain forever. Um, and I just, I love it. And because she says that, then they all kind of party. And I'm like, you know, the father is so detached. I think that he probably would have no knowledge of this going on. Um, this party in her room that's happening. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, that's going to be loud. Yeah, although, uh, and I, I mentioned this before off the podcast, but where we're kind of bringing it up here. Uh, also, spoilers for uh, the anime of Monster Hunter. 
or not Monster Hunter, goddamn Monster Rancher. Uh, so Monster Rancher, uh, real quick synopsis, uh, was a video game series that got an anime version. The kind of cool thing about the games was that the whole premise of them were, it was kind of like Pokemon, where you're capturing and raising monsters, yeah. but the way you did it was instead of like beating monsters in submission and then throwing balls at them to capture them in the balls, you use CDs. Okay. And then the CDs, whatever CD, you, uh, whatever the kind of stripe of data was on there would generate a monster. So people that had like huge music collections or other kind of games and stuff could use their CDs to just generate monsters for the game. Uh, and there was a lot of in-world kind of like implications of that. But in the anime, they kind of have a similar thing where they build up this whole big uh, uh, venture, main characters from uh, the real world essentially gets dropped down into this world of monsters, has to fight uh, the evil sorcerer that controls the land. He and his buddies team up to take it on, um, but his buddies end up basically sacrificing themselves uh, in order to go ahead and fight this great threat that still manages to basically half destroy the world, but then send him back to uh, the real world. Mm -hmm. So he's left in a state where he doesn't know what's happened to them, they don't know what's happened to him, but, and I, it took me a while to kind of confirm this, that's why I was looking at my phone earlier, because I'm like, I, either I am just having a fucking Mandela effect where I blended things in my brain, or I'm not, rem just something's not being remembered right. And the issue that I was having is I couldn't find the exact scene, because technically, the ending of the anime is not where the dub ends. The American dub release ends at season two, but the actual anime had three seasons. So every time I kept looking up for the ending of the series, I was not finding what I was trying to find because they're different. Okay. Um, but the ending of season two, so the ending for the American dub, is the ending of Labyrinth, where he is in his room trying to figure out what happened to them, and then he sees them kind of in the reflection of his mirror, and then he turns around, they're all there, like, oh, no, we're all fine, and they have a little party in his room. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting and fascinating that growing up like i mentioned you know when i was a wee lad watching labyrinth and then kind of getting that first taste of like a reference really for me in an entirely different anime that had really nothing to do with labyrinth aside from just like i said you know some interesting parallels but just having that just always solidified that in my brain of that kind of concept for me yeah that's that's pretty cool um uh, as the last thing, though, for the the movie itself here, with the party outside the window is a snowy owl, which we are going to take that that is Jareth. Um, and Jareth kind of flies off as the one not included in this party. Yeah, he... um, contented to be the bad guy because I am always the bad guy. Or just sulky in general. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to be part of your superiority. So, um, but also in line with what you were just saying, there is, um, so, uh, Maurice Sendak, the, uh, author of Where the Wild Things Are, which we see in this as well, in her room, because we had panned over it before, uh, had another story, I guess, outside over there, which... Um, there could have been a legal issue because that is a story about a girl whose sister is taken by goblins. Huh. Yeah. Uh, and there was uh, some kind of worked out about whatever, but um, they, um, you know, the Henson group was like, you know, we, we owe a lot to, to we, you know, we thank them, basically. Same thing with um, the Escher estate and, and all of that being like... Um, a part of this otherwise they really couldn't have had this scene they also have that as a big thank you too which that's so weird because i feel like that would fall perfectly in line i mean granted i imagine actually no it wouldn't be until around 2000 that like fair use proper was hammered out because that was part of the digital money and copyright act yeah so yeah yeah so that wasn't a thing then yeah um now this, all, uh, of course, has a cult following. If you don't know that this is a cult following, surprise, run into a hot topic somewhere, uh, a torrid, uh, um, uh, basically anywhere that's going to sell some kind of 
toy version of anything culty, you're gonna find labyrinth. I, I'm sure if one in you know at least one in five thirty year olds is gonna have a fond memory of David Bowie's bulge. So yes, uh, we didn't really <laughs> talk much about that, but that is another starring character in this. Like every scene he's in, just about you know the camera wants to look up at his face, but it's always perfectly like at his torso. So like his face and his perfectly bulging sack is just always in frame at the same time. The problem is, um, the puppets that they are using, uh, as well as the individuals who are in um, the creature creations are all about, like, hip or thigh level. Yeah, he's gonna poke someone's eye out. <laughs> so, they kind of have to keep them at least a little bit in frame, which means his business is also in frame. Um, Not helped by the fact that he's wearing, like, the tightest of, like, pure white, like, riding pants. They are gray, and they do have a pattern on them. So anyone who is... They do. It's almost like... um uh water on a pool fascinating i always thought they were a solid color they are not there's like there's a bit of a pattern to them so anyone who is trying to recreate the uh the outfit if you're trying to go for as close as possible um just take an extra look at a couple of scenes where you are very close there but at least like to the knee section I think when he's looking out the window to see what's happening at the Goblin City, you can see that there's a bit of a pattern on the jeggings um, or on his sort of legging things, but they are grayish and uh, there is some kind of patterning on them. Okay. Uh, if you don't care, no one's going to notice because it's iconic enough if you've got the wig and the coat um, and the very tight pants. Yeah, so, don't forget the cod piece. I mean... I mean, unless you don't need it. I mean, if, if you're packing yourself already, I mean, fucking kudos to you. But, you know, probably still want the codpiece on there anyway. You don't want to go poking anyone's eye out. Yeah. I think part of the problem with it, though, is that they're hiked up to basically his his chest, which is... Um, yeah, he is kind of he does kind of look like he's urkling it a bit. I'm, pretty much. It, they're, they're very high-waisted. Um, so, <laughs> it does have a pattern. But... Um, that that kind of the last of it is he goes off they're having a party one of the things um with the the movie is that um even though it has a cult following now it did not get the best reviews really really um it originally um opened at number 8 in the box office what was it up against? Karate Kid 2, uh, Back to School, Top Gun. Back to School is a Rodney Dangerfield film. Oh, okay. Yeah, for um, the time that makes sense. Top Gun. Ugh, all right, yeah. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Fuck off, all right. Uh, and then second week it dropped to number 13. Um, had a budget of 25 mil. Really? They did all that with 25 mil? Yep. That's, all right, I'm actually impressed by that. Uh... They got 12.9 back Ooh. until it became really popular overseas when it was um, shown. And then they made 34 mil. Holy fuck. All right. Uh, but, of course, I, I, I truly hate um, a lot of critics in everything that critics do. Um, although we're over here being uh, critical of everything and critiquing on our own, I, I don't think that a lot of critics give everything the shot that it should. No, I, I think anyone that has the audacity concern to actually identify as a fucking critic needs to get off their fucking ass and uh, realize that there's more to life and fucking touch grass. Uh, there, there's a difference between having an opinion on thing and being a critic. Um, yeah, I don't think that we're Frasier. Um, <laughs> you know... No, exactly. Think, that that is the perfect way to put it. We are not the Crane Boys, uh, no. staring at something. And I do, although I do love one of the Crane Boys. I I don't I don't consider myself one. I, I much do, more yes. than Daphne over here. <laughs> so, uh, still though, it has mixed reviews for a lot of people. 
that watch it, 75% on Rotten Tomatoes is the average. That's, yeah, that's that's lower than I thought it would right? be. Right? I figured it would be in the 80s. Yeah. You know, some people don't enjoy it, but they already knew they weren't going to enjoy it, so they didn't fucking watch it. So why bother? So you wouldn't have contributed to the score, but 75 but some of the quotes from the actual critics, like Siskel and Ebert or whoever, yeah. whenever whoever actually reviewed it said that this movie never really comes alive. And another one said, awful, pathetic story. So I want you to think about that. Now, they, when they, there were also other um, critiques of it that said that this is more accessible than The Dark Crystal. Oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Um... But the story had many rewrites. So um, Terry Jones was brought on and did the screenplay, but the actual shooting script was uh, George Lucas, Laura Phillips, and Elaine May, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, So it did change, but the script also changed like 25 times, and it was only really ready before shooting. One of those instances was that... um, Jareth was actually using the labyrinth as a way to keep people from getting to his heart. Huh. And I think that that's such a fascinating take. Um, in fact, I think Jones has said to that it, the movie isn't what he wrote anymore based on what they did for the actual film. Um, and it's something that's a bit of a cross between his and what they actually did. I think I like that concept a lot more. Right? But... David also read the script, so David Bowie read the script, and said that it was too dark, and there wasn't enough humor, and he was at a stage, um, according to some of the things that I read, that he was at a stage that he was ready to walk. Really? Yeah, and so they said, okay, well, we're going to do some rewrites, did some rewrites to add more humor in it, and that's one of the reasons why we see him so interspersed, is because he is also providing some of the humor but also needed to be more part of the story. Um, and originally he was uh, in one of the original uh, screenplays was only supposed to be seen at the very end. Um, like the heart of the labyrinth was only supposed to be seen at the very end, never before then, but we keep cutting back to him being in his castle. Some films do some film writers do this where, after you know x amount of years they'll actually release the original intended script online did they ever release the original for that or one of the other versions i don't know actually they may have because that would be neat to actually go back and if they have online some of the other older drafts especially for that you know the labyrinth you know being a way to stop because that's such a really cool Maybe it's, again, re-recency bias with Persona 5 there. I know. Uh, but I, I, I just love the concept. his heart. Exactly. Yeah. Um, literally go through his palace to get to his heart. Yeah. Especially considering Matarame had the fucking MC Escher uh, section in his palace. Exactly. So um, there, there are many things that we've recently encountered in our life that we have shared. Um, and that's a, that's another one. So, um, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention was, um, I, I don't know their relationship, Brian Henson and Jim Henson. I don't know what their relationship was, but, um, I am always envious of them when there's a moment when, uh, Jim is doing the puppeteering of one of the mouths in the um the inside the labyrinth sort of background documentary and brian henson is there to do some of the other puppeteering and he jim says you know you know um do the mouth with me and so they both are there doing the puppeteering together and I am envious of them being able to work together like that. And especially considering how in sync they are. You know, Jim says yeah. uh, in that scene, you know, he says, all right, I'll lead. And then there's no, like, practice. There's no yeah. hesitation. It's just the second he goes, his brother's in perfect synchronicity with him. Son. Son. Oh, son. Son. I thought that was his brother. Son? Pretty sure it's his son. You're going to make me a little concerned now. I could have sworn it was his brother. 
Um, so with, uh, with that, I'm always, I'm always envious, but, um, the, the, uh, puppeteering is incredible. They've done an amazing job, but, uh, with the other part of this that I wanted to mention about, you know, Jim Henson, um, yeah, he's the son. Okay. And, um, the, this was Jim's last... Um, uh, feature, well, feature film that he directed, mm. and there was something that I didn't dig too deep into, but I guess it was in one of the harder times for Jim Henson that this was like he wasn't received very well, I guess, mm. um, which is really sad that he was struggling at this time because this has become a big part of so many people's lives. Like people spend years on costumes, they. They dress up as the characters for conventions and, um, you know, they're impersonators. They do, they're, it's, it's truly been a part of so many people's lives. I mean, there's, this has definitely served as the gateway drug to, I'm sure, a, a lot of theater kids' hearts, to yeah. a lot of tabletop players' hearts, and, you know, even people that maybe this was their first introductory to a fantasy setting at all. Truly. Um, and they wanted to pull in from all different kinds of that sort of fairy tale feeling. There is something that I also think about all the time when I'm building anything with glitter or um, if I'm making any kind of set piece or something like I made um, an Audrey two uh, for our window for um, Halloween. So all types of things that I build like that, if it's out of cardboard, if it's out of foam, if it's out of anything, but especially if I'm working with glitter in any way, what they do is they basically have a spray adhesive that they're blowing the glitter and spraying the spray adhesive at the same time. And I have always kept that in my brain ever since I saw it. It was just, it's such a good way to get glitter to be all over everything. So if that is your intent, absolutely. Blowing the glitter while at the same time using a spray adhesive at the exact same time. Um, you would be very upset about all of that. However, <laughs> if you're looking at all of the set pieces, they're just covered in glitter and like cobwebs, and it's gorgeous. They've done an amazing job, truly. They as did. far as I'm concerned, glitter is the herpes of the craft world. I, I understand why people say that. I do. Um, I think that it is uh, more of a detriment to the environment than what we originally even knew. Because it's little pieces of plastic. Yeah. But um, there are more biodegradable options. There are also um, ones that are environmentally safe and all of that, which is really cool. Um, but I really don't think that it is getting the rap that it should. The problem is that certain glitters travel too easily. It's that um, the air will pick it up. And it can then get everywhere. I have some that I've put on my nails that because it's not in an area where I have a vacuum running at the same time, it doesn't suck all that in. It's how you manage the glitter that's the problem. Fair. So, yes, I can understand that. But also, you have to be somewhere that you're going to encounter it. So it's also your fault if you get it on you. So, I wouldn't say necessarily it's like herpes. I would say that it is like glitter. Glitter is like glitter. You heard it here first. Exactly. Uh, but anyway, last thoughts for, for this for me. I still love this film. I will always love this film. Um, and I, I don't think anything is, aside from, you know, all the terrible news that could come out about people that we have encountered before of things that have ruined parts of my childhood. Um, this has held a very, very dear spot in my heart for, for many years. Um, I have so many memories from it, as well as more memories that I continue to make from it. So, um, oh yeah, and my 13-hour clock that I made. Yes. So, um... Which we still gotta find a good spot for, uh... You don't like where it is? Where is it right now? It's in my office. Oh, is it in your office? I walk I, by it every day. I, it's genuinely blended in so much with the environment, I don't notice it. That's amazing. It also has a mask on it, so that's pretty incredible. But, um, yeah, it's it's in my office. I guess it's true. You know, the more you get used to something, the more it just kind of... Very true. But, um, yeah, so there's there's all sorts of things that are still tied into my life. 
I think it's a, a good film, but I am biased. I saw it when I was a kid. I still think there are some really cool things visually that happen, um, like behind the the questioning door. Um, guys are um, a visual indicator of the doors that are to come with the knockers, and I pointed that out to you. And so I can still find things that are sort of new to me, but. Um, I recommend it. I still recommend it um, to anyone, especially if you have, I would say, young kids who aren't going to focus only on David Bowie um, and what is seen by David Bowie. Because as a kid, I didn't, that wasn't anything that came to mind. Um, Maybe the subconscious got buried something in there and that explains a few things as we both got older, but... But certainly not, like, <laughs> as a kid. Maybe, no. But I, I certainly watched it in my, you know, teen growing up years um, and coming of age years, but never as a kid would I have recognized anything along those lines. So um, I still think it's a great film. I think it's a good film to watch for the puppetry. I think it's a good film to watch um, for uh, some dialogue. And I think that it's just a, a fun kind of film. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, this is a film that I will never tire of. It is on the, you know, finite list of films that I could endlessly put it on and just, yeah, I'm always down to watch it. Uh, I still think the film holds up in many ways. Uh, the music, well, again, it still does not really aid the story in any way. I think is still a fucking bop, still yeah. very catchy. Uh, the atmosphere alone especially if you're someone that really likes just a good visual storytelling th this movie has it in spades uh if you're someone that does appreciate special effects again the the amount of work that went into it and just the how much they had to craft and invent for this film uh because that was one of the things they talked about too was not only was humongous something that they had like a month to go ahead and get working. They had to invent whole new things to even get it to work. And with Ludo, Ludo was a very heavy suit that was puppeteered by a single human at a time. Um, they had to make it much lighter than what it was because originally it was like 170 pounds or something. Is that what they said? Yeah. 40? I don't remember, but it was way too It was big. basically this, the weight of a whole adult human. Yeah. Um, so they had to make it much lighter and they had two different, um, uh, puppeteers that kind of switched off and on who was inside the suit. So there's a lot of really cool stuff, um, as far as all of the things that they had to accomplish in order to actually accomplish this film. And especially with going into the detail with Hoggle, cause there was, oh, yeah. uh, like we said, there's like five people operating it. Uh, you had the actress inside Hoggle's suit, Sherry, yeah. Sherry. Uh, and then she still had her own, like hand gloves that were custom to go to a special length for them yep. but then the mask which the mask had people operating the eyes people operating the mouth people operating the eyebrows and uh i think there was people operating the cheeks and then jim hansen or brian hansen doing the voice as well and all of them had to practice and be in sync for all five people working on this together to where they could just instinctually know, okay, we're getting for this, and then all be in perfect synchronization. Yep. That is fucking wild to me. Yeah. Um, they did an incredible job. I think Hoggle is probably one of my favorite puppets that they've done because it requires so many key pieces um, of everything that kind of comes together with puppetry. Uh, it, there's the actual... Um, human who is part of the puppet, um, including Sherry having to have those things on her hand and having to figure out how to pick things up with those. Um, and then doing the body movements while there's this whole head on her that requires a voice to go along with it, as well as all of the facial movements that go along with it. So it's, um, it's quite a lot combined. Um, and I think that it really brings everything together that has so many advancements to make this one character successful. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think it's a, a good film. Um, I will always watch it when I'm sick. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a comfort for me, which is, you know, exactly at the end. Sometimes, you know, I'll need you. Yeah. Brings it all full circle, which, uh, speaking of which, uh, the next thing we will be going over again, we're kind of, shuffling things around still as we speak 
Uh, but the next thing that we're going to be doing uh, is a little bit outside of comfort because uh, it is going to be finally the first game we've covered uh, on this podcast. Uh, since? Since. Oh, my favorite game. Oh, yeah. Uh, House in Pena Morgana. That's right. <laughs> Our three-parter. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my favorite game. I like, forgot. Trauma. How can I forget that we played through that? Yeah. How um, could we? How could we forget? <laughs> I would like I would like suggestions of how we could forget. Alcohol. Lots of it. No, that's not going to work. Um, but yeah, our, our next game that we're going to Yes, play. our next game. Some would argue our first actual proper game. I may, Maybe that's probably where my brain was going, but my mouth was too fast for <laughs> um, but yes, uh, we're still not doing What Remains via Finch just yet. Uh, that game takes, uh, again, a, a little bit of good time to get through and, uh, you know, might not be in the right headspace with other things that are going on in our lives right now. Um, but I wanted to at least still do one of the games that I picked out and that is Baba is You, which is a very interesting puzzle game it's definitely not a game we're gonna beat before doing the recording for uh a buddy of mine that is very big on logic puzzles has taken like a month plus to work on the game and still hasn't beaten it in that span of time uh so i imagine well uh my my lovely assistant here is far brighter than i on these things assistant yeah my lovely assistant as the magicians would say i know no. No. No, you wouldn't say? No, I, I am not the assistant here. You are the doctor? I am the doctor. I that am the right. assistant. That is right. You, companion. you are my companion. That's fair. Okay. So as the doctor, uh, we'll go ahead and be much better at the logic puzzles than I. I mean, I'm good at a good word puzzle, but uh, logic puzzles are not always my strong suit. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes if my brain's firing on all cylinders or if it's not but that's going to be our next one we are going to try and get a couple of other things in there too um but we're hoping to have at least the a, a game for our next one yes and then after that uh might be what remains of the adventure then if not it'd be your last pick which do you remember what your last pick was the mummy the mummy because of my birthday yes which also kudos to that glorious man for finally getting an oscar or some kind of a I think he got a Best Acting Award uh, yesterday or something like that. Uh, I think that's the Golden Globes that Golden recently Globe. happened. However, uh, he will never go to a Golden Globes event again uh, because of the things that happened to him by the the runner of the Golden Globes. Oh. Yeah. So, um, but uh, because uh, this is my my birth month that we are recording in. Um, I, I have chosen things that make me happy and the mummy makes me happy. And I chose things that I think uh, better align to your interests. One, I wish I know because we've talked about it before, which is what remains via the Finch. Yes. Uh, and the other, uh, a puzzle game that I feel like is a hundred percent up your alley. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you showed it to me at one point and I was like, yeah, that seems interesting, but also, I don't know. We're going to try and get done as much as we can, um, which sometimes that makes it a little bit more difficult instead of trying to play through it just as... Um, without oh, more leaderly, yeah. So um, with that, then, I think we are at the end of our episode for, for Labyrinth. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending time with us and listening to all of our tangents. And hopefully we'll see you uh, again next time. Hell yeah. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.